How's the mana transfer going to work between Ilya and Berserker? Oh, God. That, that's not how that works. <laughs> she has to... What? I guess we should probably do an intro. <laughs> We've been going for about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> only an hour. Only an hour in. Welcome to another episode of the Weeb Crew Podcast. You're welcome, Patreon listeners. Uh, we'll probably we'll probably find a place for uh, I'll that figure discussion. it out. Um I'm your host, Booby. Uh asshole over there is Sai. Complaining as always. <laughs> <laughs> um and today. We have uh, Overworked Salaryman of the Overworked Salaryman channel uh, joining us. Hello. Welcome. Um, Wait, why am I saying welcome? Yes, <laughs> welcome them to our channel. <laughs> welcome to the Weave Crew podcast. I'm your, who just do another intro. <laughs> I'm your guest. <laughs> I am your guest. Um, I guess for anybody that's not super familiar with your content, uh, what kind of videos do you typically do and how would you kind of in- describe your channel? Uh, I-, I guess I would describe it as like pure chaos in a way because <laughs> the, the, the videos do <laughs> tend to jump in variety quite a fair bit. I, I don't, mostly they do end up being about like uh, console games, mm-hmm. the, the shit games of Japan, as well as uh, doujin events or just events in general that I just happen to go to and just like, cover as well. And on top of that, I just sometimes talk about the game industry here and there since I do work in it as well. Mostly those three, but it's like my plans typically aren't that long term. So it, it, whatever comes, it just comes. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a chaotic mess at times. <laughs> I guess what kind of got you go- started into making videos? Um, I know you kind of talk about uh, Kusuge stuff um, and like people being inspired by like AVGN and stuff like that when you did your... Um, 2000 subscribers uh, content special oh. um but is, is that kind of why you started talking about like making youtube videos was because of kusuge specifically or initially when it first started off it's more like i used to stream a little more before i started the youtube channel and during that time like sometimes we would just talk about dojin stuff as well because like I, I do sometimes disappear from streams like i'll just cancel all streams so i can go to an event and the like and one mm. thing i kind of realized with all of that is that when it comes to Dojin events, the general impression is that it's basically just like porn for the most part. And, and that's like yeah. what is very prevalently known about it. But yeah. usually at these events, I would say, like if you take Comic Cat out of the picture, because that one's a little bit of an exception, typically like adult content is only like 30% of the event. And there's just a large variety of everything else as well. So like part of it was initially me wanting to uh, show people like what, else that is to this event as well as well as just talk about like some of them because it feels like something that people might be interested in and the kusoge thing was like it, it does feel like when it comes to a lot of it that there just isn't really anybody outside of japan talking about it as much like this these things get talked to death within japan because you know there are just many channels that are really interested in it as well so mm-hmm. i figured i'd just try to put my own spin on things and just like show it to people outside of Japan as well, especially since the whole ranking thing feels like something most people would never have heard of as well, since there is a ranking for the worst castle games of the year. Yeah, that's not a very common thing. <laughs> like, that's not something I, I hear talked about a lot, is the rankings. Like, Kusuge is already kind of a niche topic in the West. Yeah. The specific well, rankings. the inverse, like people giving like their, their top like best games of the year, but not really specifically like the worst. good games or anything like that. Yeah, like, like to me, it's a uh, kind of fun to talk about. Like, for although I would say more so than like AVG and the Irate game, I think for me it was uh, Red Letter Media's uh, the best of the worst series that got me into this. If anything, to be honest. Uh, oh like, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Where, where they do like talk a lot about like shitty movies and the like. And mm-hmm. like, what one thing I kind of realized watching those videos as well is that typically when you watch content about people talking about the worst possible, like content in the medium it kind of gives you a different perspective on it and it helps to like mm-hmm. especially for people who have no experience with the medium understand it a lot better since when the movies are getting like the most basic things wrong and you can verbalize and explain this to people it kind of helps people 
who aren't very familiar with creating like movies in their case or like games, what you don't want to do because those things can be pitfalls as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think with what's important with uh, Red Letter Media stuff is like they have like a genuine, like I feel like that's the same with like Kusogate, like this stuff is like there's a genuine appreciation for these, like the crafts of these things um, where a lot of like the best of the worst is like they are laughing at the pitfalls, but it's more of like, it feels like more like they're laughing with it. Like there's still like appreciation. Well, they, they themselves where like, have made shitty movies yeah. and they know what it's like to make a shit movie. Like I've seen like where they were, I forget what movie it was they're talking about, where they're talking about this one and like it has like this character that gets like pulled into a book or something and or like a trap door or something. And like oh, the yeah, way it does yeah, it yeah. is like they fold the person and like they're laughing at it because it looks like silly. But then it's like, oh, that's kind of kind of ingenious way to do that. Like, yeah, <laughs> from yeah. like a limited perspective, like limited budget, because it's like you just have somebody like basically standing up and like somebody like falling into the hole kind of thing. And it's just, there's like that level of appreciation that's there that makes it more interesting and worthwhile to listen to as opposed to just like somebody like just tearing into it completely and just talking about how bad it is. Right. Yeah, for sure. Which right. is why uh, like, when I try to do it as well, it's like where possible, I try to give the game props of what it does. But although, one thing I'm realizing is that when I look through the backlog of those that I haven't talked about, some of those tend to have that a little more than the ones that I have talked about so far as well. That's the only thing. It's like, in a way, some of the titles do do things that are very interesting as well. Although I feel like those tend not to make the list. That are still considered console games. Mm-hmm. Especially the ones from like Idea Factory, for example. But they just don't tend to end up on the list because the list just has, like, especially the ones that wouldn't tend to be games that are very uh, horrible. Where it's like, you can't, is it like, you can't even, like, decipher what the intent was supposed, what were they trying to do, even? Yeah, like, some of it really is just that, like, sitting there and trying to understand, like, why something is balanced the way it is. Or, like, yeah. trying to figure out how the game was actually built. Like, I think, no, like, you know what? Actually, no. Pro, pro, pro Golf War Saru was actually one. Like, it's a game that was presented as a golf game, but mm-hmm. it's actually a, when you dig into how it was designed, it's basically a point and click game because you you don't really get that level of precision with your golf ball. Like, depending oh. on where you're pointing, there's probably like a few rectangles on the screen, and it will just play you an animation whenever you hit the ball in there. So it's more like a point and click adventure game that. Yeah, it's designed to the give the player the impression that it's actually a actual golf game, and in a way that actually made it kind of enjoyable still for the first one hour, especially when you realize that the dev team was super small and they probably didn't have the ability to make a full-on golf game. But then right, yeah. you, but when you, if you realize how it was designed, it, it just kind of like ruins the complete immersion of the game, because you kind of realize that you don't really have much control. You you probably hit the ball the same way with the same level of accuracy every single time if you aim in the same spots and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you engage and like consume uh, Kusoge and like games in general differently since you kind of have had the experience of like working in the industry as opposed to like when you were younger? Uh, yeah, I feel like it made me a little more cynical in a way to be honest. Like, <laughs> like when I look at like, especially nowadays since like gacha games are more of a thing than before, whenever I play something, yeah. And I look at the systems in the game and I, or I look at the balance, like the way like a gacha game gives out its uh, gems, the difficulty levels of the enemies at each individual like stage that you go through. I'm just sitting there going like, what is their angle? Where, where is the point where they're trying to make me feel miserable so that I'll spend money and stuff like that? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And when it comes to like uh, strategy games especially, I'll just look at the uh, attack and the damage that you actually deal to enemies, like stuff like, uh, I guess like, more like Battle Brothers and some of the other indie like, titles and I'll just be like what 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 was what is the formula that they were probably using why did they go with this and stuff like that like trying to figure out why mm-hmm. they chose to calculate damage in specific ways and think about whether or not it could be improved and stuff like that looking at like the design of the level itself as well and just like getting triggered over like the most like mundane shit as well like like sometimes <laughs> it'll be just like mount QOL things that aren't there or that are there and it's like you just start wondering why it isn't there. Like, 
your mm-hmm. standard like virtual novels having a auto button, for example, and then you play an RPG mm-hmm. game, you're know, like, why why is there no button to let the text like crawl on its own? And even like the simple things like that, just like yeah, yeah, it's like basic quality of life stuff. Yeah. So what 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 kind of got you into getting into the game industry? Was it kind of just being like critical of stuff like that before, or is that just purely something that came like afterwards, like when she kind of got in? Oh, yeah, that's like gonna go into an entire like life story to be honest, Casa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to put it very simply, it's like initially when I was younger, like oh, that makes me feel really old. But okay, uh, when I was a lot <laughs> younger, it's like as in before I went into university, I really wanted to go into game design already because it, it seemed like something really interesting at the time. But the issue mm-hmm. was that like back then it was a lot easier to like make a game and make money because of the fact that you had less competition. But at the same time, it wasn't like big money. So like being anyone else in the Asian family, it was like your, 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 your entire family is probably ain't going to support it either. So and I figured sure. like, yeah, I'll just like go into like business or something. And it was like just completely miserable during the entire time there. And it's like the thing that got me to like decide, okay, you know what, I'm going to, go back into it, it's gonna like brush off the dust on my non-existent, clearly not physical unity, like, and just like try to figure out how to develop stuff again. Mm-hmm. Also, when I actually went to Europe on exchange in university, and I was like talking to a bunch of people there because I was hitchhiking the entire time, and I was like, just getting exposure to like the different ways of thinking about like, you know, maybe not everything in life has to be about like fucking money first. You know, maybe you want to do a job that gives you like value in life or something. And a lot yeah. of that actually struck a chord mm-hmm. since like, you, you don't really get talk about that as much in Asia. It's just like, now son, you're going to become a dentist or a lawyer or a businessman when you grow up. And, and that's basically all of it. And, and so at the time yeah. I was like, yeah, you know what? May, maybe fuck all of that. Let me just give it a try. Since uh, if I did go into like finance and marketing, I'll probably be miserable the rest of my life. And that's what got me back in, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of a point where it's like, there's enough money, right? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't improve the quality of life in, in the sense of like, you get nicer things and have more money or whatever, but... You are able to sustain yourself on a daily basis. Yeah, but the, there's a point where it's just like, this is enough. I don't... You, you don't have to have more than this to be happy necessarily. Yeah, this, and that was what uh, made me decide, yeah, you know what, maybe like even if game design didn't make too much money it's like it's fine as long as i'm making enough and like through this work it can like give people something fun to do with their time well, that was good enough for me yeah. at the time yeah. although like now they have came full circle around it uh i have to thank like pokemon go for that because like like every other boomer they actually got into it as well and they're like oh games do make money well done son <laughs> <laughs> Oh wait! We're seeing the error money with these. Yeah, like oh, this this, <laughs> thing, this thing we thought you were a failure for pursuing for the past ten years is uh, actually not that bad. It's like yeah, that's like the like character arc of like a bunch of like late nineties, early two thousands. Like I'm thinking like especially something like Freddy Got Fingered, where it's like you can make money with these drawings. Huh, <laughs> I guess I guess there really is value in it. Yeah, it, it was a <laughs> bizarre change, I guess, especially since games back then. Like I, I think it's like no matter which country, it probably had the same thing of like there was this. It, it just had this kind of very negative impression to it. It's like oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's drawing your kids away from uh, actually working. They're gonna turn to satanists or something along the way. If you give them too many games, especially when it's like it's it's like so close to something like well, you could just be a software engineer instead. That makes a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, that as well. I think there are some pitfalls to games being as popular as they are, just because growing up Mm -hmm. a lot of like a lot of kids like you remember like uh 30 years ago 20 years ago the thing is like i want to be a rock star and that was kind of like the perception of like the easy thing to do to minimize the amount of work and maximize the amount of like gain kind of thing whereas like now it's like i want to be a streamer i want to play do let's plays and stream i want to i want to be a youtuber i want to be a podcaster man imagine being a podcaster imagine that um but i i I think of like when I was younger and like my brothers, like the interest in game, like not not to sound like because that's this is not really what I'm getting at, but not to sound like I'm saying like, oh, kids these days don't go outside or whatever. But I feel like before games got as popular as they were, you'd have 
hobbies that you took up more of your time than um, video game, like a game or something. And that would kind of lead you into finding like a skill or something that you're interested in. And I feel like that's still a thing with like video games. Obviously, you can go into video game development and stuff like that. But I feel like a lot of kids kind of get aimless in a way where they kind of don't like they know what they kind of want to do. Like, oh, I like video games and I like writing. So I want to try to write for video games. But there then becomes like the saturation where it's like how many kids are going to try to write for a video game? How many, how many kids want to, are growing up wanting to be an ideas guy? Yeah, like that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a big um, thing with like the games as well. Whereas like before, like for all the boomer speak that there is or whatever, like if you were like really into bikes and like tricking out your bike or whatever, that could hypothetically lead into, I don't know, you're like, you got your first car and like, like to trick out your car and then you got a job in as a mechanic or something. So it made kind of your life path more clear, I guess. Right, yeah. Whereas like, there's a difference between like your hobbies now and like what you're doing like professionally. Yeah. At least for most people. Hmm. Yeah. I feel like a part of that really is just that like, especially when it comes to games, typically games are designed with like, you, you don't like, even if you talk about something like Dark Souls, for example, the difficulty <laughs> of the game is typically tailored such that people still have fun. Like there, there is an entire like, uh, I think it was a science article thing by some guy talking about the uh, science of fun as well, where like because of the fact that like you want people to enjoy the fun and the challenge always has to be balanced to a certain level. And I feel like in a way, mm-hmm. because of that, it's addicting because the, the, you're always getting challenged at like to some extent the levels that you want to be. But unlike like a hobby, like say, like you were mentioning like with bikes and the like, where the, the difficulty is there and you need to learn and overcome it. With games, you could just do things like turn down the difficulty or turn it up and you don't really like get oh, yeah. a like physical skill that might be as transferable perhaps but at the same time it does feel like especially with Japan because of how the dojin community works there are many people who do end up picking up very strange skills in their pursuit of like creating like side content for like the games or the animes that they like as well like mm-hmm. in, to, to some extent I feel like that's what makes the Toho community in Japan one of the one, most uh, shocking ones for me still. Like, I'm hmm. going to, like, Ray Tai Sai is the name of the big, like, Toho event, and I'm just, like, seeing people doing, like, leather works, selling, like, necklaces, short glasses, and stuff like that. Wood, oh, wood yeah, carvings. Yeah, yeah. And that makes up, like, quite Making, a fair like, bit of what... Really, the, like, yeah, intricate, like, character goods. Yeah, it, there's a lot of, like, all of this, like, you can see that people are putting in uh, effort, and it's paying off in ways outside of the game itself. In that sense, like yeah. there are even like fairly big like power metal bands that came out of like, oh, we're just gonna cover Toho music. And then now they are <laughs> breaking in uh how, how many do they have actually? Let, let me see. One of the bigger ones that came out of Toho is called Unlock the Morpheus. They had 167k subs on YouTube now, which Oh wow. Yeah, for for a band to have their own like or like for a Originally, Toho band going to their own original music now, and like yeah, that's not bad at all. Yeah, it's it's pretty good, and like people do find success from these Dojin communities, and that's like something that I guess in a way like the existence of the uh fan Dojin content scene in Japan in a way that it exists actually helps to some extent with people still finding skills that end up getting them ahead in some way or another as well. Yeah, I mean it makes sense because like if you're really into some like. Something like anime specifically, right? If you like engaging with anime in a specific way, um, like you, I don't, you, you're really into mecha anime and you like engaging with like Gunpla as an example, like that could translate into like a skill potentially. Um, like if you start making garage kits or your own kind of like kit bashing or whatever. So that there's, there's definitely like stuff around the hobbies that can lead to you know, finding yourself in a way. It's just, I, I think a lot of kids just engage with games as the game, right? I don't, there's not, especially in the West, it doesn't feel as much like there's kind of like the otaku culture of, uh, you know, making your your own thing. Um, I know you'll see occasionally like, um, there's like, <laughs> there's like people like, uh, 
remember seeing a YouTuber who made paper dolls of all their favorite anime characters and were like talking about how the the process of like making these characters as a like a 3D um character, right? Like an like actual figure with like actual articulation with paper. <laughs> so like it's not that it's like completely doesn't exist, but it it doesn't feel as like celebrated or um present, I guess, as like a otaku community. Like you don't have like a comic cat in the West. Like you that would be our Comic Con or something. And um, there's not AX, really the recently. Yeah, or AX. Um, but there's not really a whole outside of like the artist alley, which is mainly just kind of like consumer. I mean, it's right? a big like, component of a lot of like events like that, but it is not you, you don't really have events that are just artist alleys. Right. Yeah, especially with AX, because I was actually talking to some of the people in the Discord who actually went for the event as well, and they were mentioning how like the event, the type of content that it generates was something that uh, even the animation studios, the anime companies from Japan that went over, when they looked at it, they were kind of saying that like it's kind of not what we expected and that it was kind of lacking in a way. And this was due yeah. to the fact that... Yeah, this is to the fact that when they came over, they were expecting maybe like people to be making their own like unofficial dojins as well and stuff like that. But it was mostly just like illustrations and art instead. That's yeah. that's kind of yeah. I remember seeing people talking about like there's a greater demand for yeah, just character like illustrations and stuff rather than people necessarily marketing their own like comics essentially. Yeah. And, and like part of it, I can kind of get it as well because like one, one thing that really shocked me was how expensive a booth was at AX. Like I heard about it oh, from yeah. some of them. It's 10 times yeah. the price of a booth in Comic Cat, to be honest. So like yeah. the biggest event in Japan is a 10th of the price. Which, uh, yeah, that kind of shocked me. The things there too are also, I think just generally more expensive than the like kind of prices that you would see for like similar things at like something like Comic Cat. Yeah, and I feel like uh, as a result of that, there's kind of a lot more pressure on them, like, especially if they want to make this their full time thing to recoup, and that makes it, like harder yeah. for them to take risk as well with creating of content when it comes to dodging yeah. content. And, so. and, and it's also like, there's just not as much. There's a much greater demand for like character illustrations of characters you already like than there is to like go out and like oh I'm just gonna I'm gonna pick up a copy of this comic or something that I'm um, I've never heard of before I'm unfamiliar with it I'm gonna take a chance on it you don't really have that as much here in the U S yeah which is kind of unfortunate like I, like I feel like some of the most bizarre like fanfics I've seen just tend to come out of this and I don't even mean like the adult content I mean just like one of the Dojin series that initially got me interested in like exploring the more like SFW, the more like just general content side of it was actually this weird hmm. crossover Dojin someone made about like Jojo and Madoka for some reason. And it's like, yeah, uh, there's this uh, YouTuber, William Chow, who has a, just a massive collection of like Dojinshi. And I remember seeing like I was watching one of his videos because I'll just like go through some of them. And one of them was like a crossover between, I want to say it was Fist of the North Star and Digikarat. Yeah. <laughs> it's like really, really specific crossovers like that that are really interesting. Yeah, and there's, there's like a lot of like, I, I don't want to use the word weird because like I, I like it in a very strange positive way, but there, there is a lot of unique content that you can find there in a sense, especially if a series yeah. like ends prematurely. In a way, the Dojin community just comes into like fight over uh well what do they think the ending could have been instead as well yeah 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 and how I guess do you to be want fair, Evangelion to end yeah there's there's more of that uh i guess i guess there's like fan fiction and stuff but people don't kind of i mean there's like a similar thing with like when attack on titan ended and a lot of people were upset with how that ended uh people went out of the way to make the what they believe to be the true ending <laughs> um I guess to I guess to play devil's advocate a bit for like anime conventions, they do kind of start they their origin point is from a different place from like a comic cat and like Dojin events. Where yeah. we, we kind of talked about this with uh the episode of William Chow, um, how they kind of started off. Uh there was kind of a, a two pronged utility to them. One was part of the fan aspect to like kind of encourage more people into getting into it. But the uh, the kind of main utility of conventions was kind of accessing anime. 
Um, yeah. Because like before you had like all of these um, companies that were bringing anime over, uh, there was the big like fan, so like fan generated scene of like just bringing the anime over on tape. Yeah. What's what's getting almost almost uh, akin to like like E3 essentially, but for anime and obviously at a much smaller scale, but yeah. Um, so it was Trade mainly kind of utilized to just introduce people to anime and like even make it accessible to them um, while kind of also having that fan element of like, oh yeah, we're all kind of here together. We all enjoy this hobby. Uh, you can join us and join, and join this hobby kind of thing where I feel like that utility aspect has obviously lost its use in uh, the last yeah, yeah. 20, 30 well, years. It, and there's just been a general shift now to just get Japanese creators over, but AX is really the only one that can afford to do so at like a massive scale that they do. Like it's going to be a lot harder to get like a, like a lot of people from trigger to appear like Imaishi and uh, Yoshinari to appear at a smaller convention. Whereas like AX can pay out the big bucks for them to show up. You almost have like these, it's almost like an odds with like the people that are attending or attending these anime conventions as a fan event. Like I, whenever I hear people talking about going to anime expo, it's just like, Oh, I want to meet up with some friends. Like I hardly ever hear anybody talk about going to panels anymore. It's just Unless like the panels are like an excuse to just meet up and like socialize this stuff. So it's like, you they see are, a creator you really like, like if like Ryukishi was at right. AX this year. And a lot of people want yeah, to there's, go. There's still like him. a few panels, but, um, a lot of like not just like AX, but like a lot of conventions across like across the country are kind of that way. Yeah. Where people aren't really like they'll go to a, a panel like when the when I last convention I went to like a lot of the panels were like half capacity unless it was like Attack on Titan or something like. But a lot of them are just right. like cosplay kind of oriented, uh, like making armor and stuff like that. Um, so there, it's, it's like it's this weird thing where they're at odds where the convention itself is still sort of structured in a way like it was 30 years ago where you have panels where like the voice actors are like telling you stories about how they start voice acting Deku or whatever but people aren't as interested in that anymore because they're consuming right. like they might just be watching the sub anime um, but they're just going to like interact with people but the convention itself hasn't really changed to be more accommodating for that like a comic cat or something might be where it's it's more fan generated content and more uh, less like industry kind of thing if that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. No, I, I get what you mean because like even here there's also our anime japan which is probably the biggest like corporate side event where right. it's really just like yeah. the animation studios themselves are going down setting up booths showing off the next season's animes and doing like uh panels and the like but I feel like in part, like the reason why with events like this is just people don't really care as much as well as also due to the fact that like you, you kind of, especially after the pandemic, you kind of can just, they started to put a lot of that content up on the internet as well. So like you could just watch the live stream on Twitch. Like one, one thing I, I found out like by sheer coincidence because someone linked me to it while I was like live, trying to live stream in Anime Japan like three years ago was that like mm -hmm. you basically had like uh entire like Spanish channels that would just sit there and translate everything on the spot and people would just watch it online as well. And I feel like especially after the pandemic, even in Japan, it's like for there was a period where Dojin events in general also saw a lot a drop in participants. And it's probably just hmm. due to the fact that there's all this convenience that like if you just wanted to go for the panels, well now you can just stay at home and watch all three panels simultaneously because like Anime Japan they had three separate stages that run concurrently. Like, why go down and stand in the crowd to listen to one when you could just stay in the comfort of your home and watch all three at once, I guess, is the thing with it. Yeah. Whereas with Dojin content, it's kind of the case that, like, more people put it online, but there's still, like, plenty of stuff that just isn't online yet. And, like, recently with the whole Visa and MasterCard thing, I, I get the feeling it's going to cause some level of a reversal of this. But at the very oh, least, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it does seem to be the case that, like, there is a bit more of a reason to still go down because... It's both to look for the stuff that you've never seen before, and for many people, it's also there to like talk to the Dojin artists like up front as well. Like, yeah, 
Hmm. I guess since we kind of been touching on it, um, would you mind kind of explaining what Comic Cat is and kind of maybe how it started? Do you, if you have that, if you're familiar enough with it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the thing with Comic Cat is that like most Dojin events, like basically the word Dojin just comes from like, uh, if you literally translate the two kanji that make up the word, it basically it translates to like similar and human. And it's basically just, mm -hmm. re it just refers to a uh, content made by people to enjoy things that they like with like other people in that sense. So you, mm. you could very well just say that like, this is the Japanese word for indie. It probably would like mean mostly the same thing because it's just people making the stuff that they like. And with Comic Cat, it initially started for, uh, I, I think the very first Comic Cat that happened had like only 30 plus circles. And I think on their official website, they said that it had like 700 plus people attending. It was a very small event where people just talked about like, very specific animes or they just make content for very specific anime series that they like mm -hmm. yeah yeah and then from there the event just like grew more and more in size probably in part due to the fact that like i think the event started back in the 70s where you didn't really have many events so it was the case that like as people came to this event they're like oh yeah we can like this is a space for us especially back then where uh you know you didn't really have the internet to the level that it exists today and right. uh, weeps used to also get shit on in Japan quite a fair bit back in the day. So this was like a place for them to gather and enjoy the things they like with like other people who enjoy the same thing. And it is likely from that where the event started to grow and grow to the point that I think the attendance by the 10th Comic Cat to be held had almost like quintupled. I would say maybe it might have actually been like seven times the original attendee like count as well. And it just grew from there to basically be a more all-encompassing event of like content that people want to create that they just want to share with people. Although you could like say that nowadays it's a little more corporatized as well since there are people who earn the big bucks from making this. But initially, I guess, like especially with those, this like Comic Can other Dojin events, it, many of them were just born from these simple, like very pure idea of like, we just want to make things and just share it with others. Yeah, and you... you Said it was like kind of stuff that people are making for by fans for fans kind of thing. Yeah, and, the, and, uh, yeah. In, in a way, there's a little bit of a new, a weird like nuance to it since you're technically not supposed to earn money from it, but many people are. But like, mm. yeah, for the most part, it was born out of and it's regulated by the idea that like, yeah, it's supposed to be a fan thing, so it's not supposed to be a highly profitable industry. Yeah, um, it's it, essentially because it's not. The perception, I think, for a lot of people in the West is doujin, like doujinshi, right? Um, of course, you kind of mentioned the the porn specific side, um, but even just like the magazines. But doujins are not just like the magazines or like the fan comics or anything like that. They're, you know, soundtracks. Like someone made you make a custom soundtrack for a manga or something or video games or even like just figure stuff. Which I guess kind of falls more into, I guess figure circles are a thing. Um, like I know at One Fest they do, they have like garage kit figure circles. I guess that kind of falls into the same umbrella a bit. Like I know when I, I went to Comic Cat, I bought like Figma accessories that someone was just selling that they had made, like little kira kira hands or whatever. <laughs> um, but like. I, that's more of like a one fest specifically or for the garage kit side, I guess. Yeah, like I would say like Comic Cat is basically the uh it's the amalgamation of all of this other events. So like when you talk about the figures like you mentioned, like Wonder Fest, that, that one is uh the pure figure one. And then you have like M3, which is like the purely like Dojin music. Well I guess at this point it's like partially it's mostly indie music as well. And you have many events like this where it's all very specialized into one thing. You have like specific like Blue Archive, Bochi the Rock events and stuff like this at a very small scale. And like in a sense, like Comic Cat is where all of this just comes into one very big location because it's it drives the most traffic nowadays as well in that sense. Is there so is there like a distinction between indie music and like Dojin music? Like I I guess Dojin music is still technically categorically indie music. But is there like, what's the distinction, I guess, between calling it Dojin 
like a Dojin soundtrack or something as opposed to just it being indie music? I guess it's just more of a modern thing. And like nowadays, when the term indie is used, you typically use it for people who are making their own original music instead. But the thing with the word mm-hmm. indie is that it's a more, it's, it's not a originally Japanese word. So it's like when right. these events came up, like the word doujin, because of how broad it is, was just basically used for all of it in its entirety. So like even now when I go to like M3, which is supposed to be the doujin music event, I'm just going there and like, people are just releasing their own like power metal, death metal soundtrack. Some guy is like playing his uh, lute, the, 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 the medieval instrument there. <laughs> and like trying to like showcase his own original loot music as well. The shredding on the loot in, <laughs> in person. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like you have a lot of that. And like, well, you know, from the outside, like especially like, I feel like most of the world would basically just call this indie music. And they themselves nowadays would probably call it indie music as well. But all of this falls into the what was the original bracket of just being Dojin music instead. Do you think they would call it indie music as a way to distinguish themselves from like Dojin stuff in general? Like the perception of it being associated with like otaku kind of hobbies? I know some of them do. Like like they just really want to push that they really want to become like, they, they really want to push the musician side of things. And so like mm-hmm. since this is the, and this is like culture of like using the hip English word instead of the Japanese word for many things. It's like mm-hmm. there, there are more people who pick up the Term nowadays as well, especially some of these street performers. Like, there, there was one guitarist I knew who, whose entire uh, career was uh, performing on the streets in Akiba once in a while, and then performing in bars around the country. And he calls himself, he considers himself indie rather than a uh, dojin, as well. Hmm. I've, well. I've noticed like with um, like on YouTube and stuff, I see the term indie anime used like noticeably more than like dojin uh, anime. Uh, as well like when people like tag their works and stuff uh which is another like interesting sort of thing yeah it really does feel like the picking up of the fact that the rest of the world is using this and they kind of want to push that like the thing that they're making is definitely an original work because like with dojin it kind of can get like mixed up with like this is based off of someone else's works like a parody or a fan work instead so there might be a part (laughs) of that where in order to reach a more global audience as well as to try and set the distinction they would call themselves that but at the same time it's like when you talk about like shaft or like studio ghibli back in the day people would just used to call them like dojin like animation companies instead but like oh. if that if that was to happen today i feel like they'll just call them like indie when they first started off if anything um i guess for people that are listening probably mainly kind of in english speaking countries i know we do we do have a couple people in japan um, that do listen, but um, but for us that don't go to Japan or haven't been to Japan, um, how common are like fan events, like Dojin events and stuff like that? Because it's not just the perception, I guess, for a lot of the West is like for like anime conventions, like you have some that are staggered out. Um, like I think my area's probably got like five major ones that are kind of staggered out through the year. Um, but people typically will only go to like one or two. And it's kind of like, a, like AX is once a year. And like, you only go to that. Um, there's not really like smaller events. So like, I guess in Japan, how frequent are these events kind of happening? Uh, I guess it depends on how you arrange it. I mean, like how you go about calculating all of it. If you're looking at it purely mm-hmm. from like, uh, just Tokyo. Even then, it's like there's probably one going on every other week, if anything. Okay. Like, like mm-hmm. frankly, it's like if I wanted to go to every single one of them, I, I would be at events like almost every week of the year. Because that's it's basically just, be a full time job. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Like, I, I wouldn't even have time to make the videos about them. That's how many they are. Oh, although the thing is that you probably wouldn't go for all of it just because many of them are very specialized. Like, I, I wouldn't be going to like the BL event on a usual basis mm. well, because it's right. just like my own personal taste like I'm not into that as much so I, I wouldn't go for that but if you were to go to everything that exists you, you could be going every week for that matter especially if like when you include the rest of Japan as well like Osaka Okinawa everything else there, I don't think there is actually a week of break or there might be one but it's just somewhere in the uh, 52 weeks that make up the year so it's hard to tell and there's like 
again, Comic Cat is kind of just the one that everyone kind of knows. Um, yeah. yeah. But there's. Comic Cat, and, and then, like, well, I know there is like a Toho specific one, but yeah, I can't even. Toho like, specific ones. Yeah. Um, what would you say are like, do you have any kind of like favorites or any that kind of stand out to you as far as like being the most kind of interesting? Um, I would say the one that. I find it quite interesting. And I think I saw this brought up when people were debating AX as well and the uh, Dojin creators there was uh, one called Comitia, where it's an event purely based and specifically for uh, original Dojin content. So basically, you can really just call it an indie event and it'll more or less be the same thing because you're only allowed to bring original works to that event so you can't make a parody of like I don't know, like Jojo or something and bring that in. It has to be mm. completely unique. And because of that, at the event, you do have uh, many of the uh, manga publications going down for it as well to basically try to scout new people or just give them feedback on how they can improve as well. So mm. the, the funny thing was that like I, I saw this brought up when people were talking about AX and how like uh, with AX, it's mostly just people selling goods and that's why the uh, Japanese publications that went over were kind of disappointed and like every Dojin event has like uh, this kind of booth set up by the publications to do this, but it's actually purely Comitia that has it. And I find it to be really mm-hmm. interesting because it's the one event where because everything is an OC work, you can really find a very big variety of content in general, some of which actually goes pretty big eventually, like uh, was it Onimai, for example? Mm-hmm. And the like, like mm-hmm. many of it first gets its uh, very big like reach at either this uh, at this event rather than Comic Cat as well, in part because like with Comic Cat it's so packed that you don't really have the time to go to everything and look through everything. But with this event at or with most events you don't get the same level of queue and uh, assholes shoving you that like Comic Cat has. So it tends to be more relaxed and people can actually look through the stuff that they find interesting. And because mm-hmm. of the fact that the publications are there, it's easier for them to then go and like get their work out as well. Is it 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 was interesting because like Comic Cat, you're buying when you're buying like the magazines and stuff, you don't really have it's it's kind of hard to just sit there and like decide if you want to buy you kind of just have to go based on the cover. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh this looks like it might be interesting. Like you can't there's not really I guess you can have time, but there's like so many people it's so packed and like the flow of traffic is just constant. It it doesn't really feel like there's a really time for you to sit there and be like, should I buy this? Or you, you just kind of have to go based on the cover and vibes. Yeah, and you have like five, six people queuing behind you, giving you a scrawl because like everybody wants to buy the thing and go on to the next booth. Yeah. yeah it, it gets really tough to do that at Comic Cat, which is why like usually I like do that mostly in the afternoon and just spend the morning uh, getting the stuff I really want to get first. But yeah, even then, it's like it's tougher to do that as compared to many of the other events. Like with M3, which is the music one, I, I really love that like I, I can take the time to go to a booth and like look at the album and be like, hey, you have a sample of the music and they would have like a headphone prepared. And I can just sit there and like listen for like two to three minutes, like a single track and be like, okay, I can vibe with this, therefore I will buy it and stuff like that. And with Comedia, it's kind of the same where like there are actually people who go there purely to sell jewelry. And I can just go there and be like, oh, this looks like a really nice necklace. Do you have more samples? And then we just sit there and like talk about it for like 15, maybe even 30 minutes. Like there's that difference in uh, the, uh, I, I guess like in a way the pressures of the event to like move on quickly in that sense with many of the events. Like in a way, mm. I feel like Comic Cat is uh, quite an exception in how rushed everything is. Yeah. Um, I guess that, that brought to mind something that I don't really hear people talk about a lot but like how how would you say like the kind of um community kind of etiquette is as far as like for example like the few interactions i had because we kind of just walked around and just was, we didn't really stop a whole lot um but like we talked to like when i went and bought the uh things the the hand things uh, the guy i was talking to uh gave threw in like free stuff in there just to i guess to be nice i don't know if it was because I was a foreigner or like <laughs> he just thought it was interesting or uh, if that's like a common thing that people kind of will do or um, and then like um, we there was a this was back in 2016 when I went and that was like during the election. Oh. So like there was a guy there that was wearing like a MAGA hat like a Trump hat and like had Trump dojins he was selling. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the cartoon version of Trump like just spouting stuff off. Like I, didn't, I couldn't read what he was saying. I don't 
know if it was like just how par par the par parodic patriotic what would be the word parodic? no no not patriotic oh. um oh. like parody i don't know how oh i'm trying to think i don't fuck i can't think of the conjugation <laughs> parodical <laughs> that's not a word um i can't think of how much of a parody it was though uh because i didn't i couldn't understand but he was like he was really nice he let us like take pictures <laughs> I was like, oh, do you mind if I take it? Because it was just like a, an oddity. Like, oh, wow. Someone's making dozens of like our, the American political system. Wait, was it a 2D um, one or was he using like figures or something? I'm sorry, was it what? Was he using, was it a 2D dojin or like, because like that. Yeah, I, 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 okay, because I was thinking of it. That, that reminded me of another one called like the Nuclear Rangers that I saw as well, which is this guy who has a bunch of like action figures of like political figures and he just like uses them in steel frame like comics that he makes. Oh yeah. So so he basically has like put in uh what's what's the North Korean guy's name? Kim Jong un? Like Trump oh, yeah, and like yeah. Shinzo Abe and he just like puts them in weird poses and like get like makes his own plot line based off of that called the nuclear rangers or something. This is this is the the guy selling the Trump dojins. <laughs> it looks <laughs> he apologized. So I assume like it's like because um. I, I you got like Shinzo Abe <laughs> there wearing uh wearing the Make America. So I'm assuming it's like very uh, scathing. <laughs> I'm, sh I'm sure he was probably like embarrassed, like, oh, sorry, I'm making funny. We didn't give a shit, but it's just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, what what is like the kind of general community feel like as far as like interacting with the creators? Like, is it kind of common to sit there and talk and kind of shoot the shit? Or is it just like a kind of purely transactional thing? Or is it kind of just very. I would say that like Comic Cat specifically tends to be a bit more transactional, but because like mm -hmm. there, there just isn't as much time to like do it because of all the people passing by. But for the most part, it's actually fairly uh, chill. Like you, you do really see like a lot of, the, especially the circles that have quite a fair bit of like a fan base going on for them. Where sometimes people would just like stop by and just pass them a drink and be like, hey, they have this on the house and they just sit there and talk for like half an hour, hour. Like, it, for the most part, when it comes to either the later half of Comic Cat where you have a bit more time to do all of this or these smaller events, it really is more friendly in general in that sense. Like eventually mm. circles would like quit, like shut down for like lunch and then just go to the other circles and buy stuff and just chat as well. Like there is a lot more of a communal feel to it in that sense. Not not so much in the sense that like people are in this close community, but like there, there are it is a lot more friendly and people are willing to just sit around and chat and like have fun with it since like that was supposed to be what the event was born out of as well yeah maybe kind of like a, a almost like a farmer's market here or something like i think y'all do have like the small kind of pop-up markets and stuff that happen um like in like an alleyway or something like they'll set up vendor booths or whatever uh not specifically just for like anime stuff but yeah it's kind of interesting like how all of that starts as well like i, I like how i met one of the uh toho like metal bands as well was through that like I, I went there like a few times and then like on I think the third or fourth time he's like hey it's you again I recognize you because you're always wearing metal shirts and I'm like oh okay cool and then <laughs> and then we just like talked for like an hour and then he's just like hey you, you want to come to our live performance I'm just like yeah sure and just like and it just like roll on from there like there's there is like a lot of that that happens you mean you didn't have the uh experience where they recognized you and you never went back <laughs> No, like I, I, I went back to the booth like every other event because I, I just followed their music to begin with. And they, like, I, I would wear like um, Western Power metal shirts and they, they do listen to that a lot apparently. So every time I went there, I went I wore a different one. Like uh, unintentionally, it's just more like... It, it was like the most comfortable shirt I had was that, so I just wore those. And he was like, mm. ah, I remember you from then. I'm like, oh. No, no, that's yeah, see... I'm I'm antisocial enough that they recognize me. I'd be like, oh well, can't ever go back there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anytime someone's like, oh, you've been here, you're like, oh, you came back. Is it the usual? I'm just like, oh fuck, I can't ever, can never step foot here again. <laughs> yeah, I guess it really depends on circles. Like some of them are really just that actor, but some are like you can really tell that the guy running the circle probably is like is very scared of social interaction as well for some of them, mm. and they have like a salesperson that helps them to like buy sell, but. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of like interactions like that, and that's like what a lot of what I like about the events as well. It's just like you you buy this weird light novel that some dude writes about like Bochi the Rock, except that she's married to a 
kita and they're in a domestic violence relationship and you're going like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and you just sit there and talk to the guy about like, what the fuck did he just make? And it's just like... That is, that is like the most interesting thing about like when they do those kind of crossovers is seeing like the weird threads that people just string together. <laughs> like, oh, Bochi's about music. Idol Master's about music. So the manager could date Bochi, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, There's like, it's a lot of that. And it's just like, especially for some of them like they really put a lot of effort into both the both and the work so like they are they're quite like happy to talk about it as well like what one of the weirdest one i have was like like on the topic of like color palettes from before some guy made like the worst looking cover book like it looked like an angel fire website where he basically oh, went through like 30 pages of just like analyzing like color palettes and like gundam sailor moon and all of that it was actually like surprising because like when you look at the cover of the book, it looks like complete ass. Because it really does look like a website from the early two thousands with like random images just thrown on there, and the text is like in a very weird jarring font. And then you just talk with me like, oh yeah, this guy actually is really interested in stuff like this as well. The text would just be rotating if it were like able to. <laughs> it, it looked like uh, I, I don't think it exists anymore. Like, do you remember like early PowerPoint? Like they had like the clip art or word art or something. Oh, like where like bounce on the, the the PowerPoint or whatever. Yeah, they had like the really weird designs for it itself, like in terms yeah, of text. Yeah, yeah. They, like he, he was using that in like two thousand and like twenty three, and I was like, where the fuck did you even find that font? <laughs> there, there is like a weird movement of like people just getting really into nostalgia stuff. I guess like back in the twenty tens, it was nineties, I guess, and now it's just coming around to like two thousands. I guess every twenty years, trends just cycle back in. I guess they become nostalgic. Um, I guess like how, since we're kind of talking about like the the communal aspect, how do like Dojin and like fan events kind of shape the anime sphere, or not even just like as a community, but like even like the industry and stuff? Because I guess you talked about how um, that one event they kind of go scout out Dojin uh, creators to like give them advice and kind of maybe bring them into the industry. But like, how do you, how have you seen that they kind of dr- has like this influence on the industry as in general. I mean, for the most part, it does feel like it actually works as a very good like starting point for many people to get into like drawing and presenting their content to people directly, especially back in the day. I mean, nowadays you do have stuff like Pixar or like DeviantArt, you can just post it online, but especially yeah. back in the day, it's like the only way you could see how good your art is was to bring it to an event like this and see how many people were actually willing to spend that 500 yen on the piece of art or the, the doujin that you made. And in a way, it, gave, it gives people quite a lot of uh, ability to refine what the, uh, their craft in a way even more, especially when it comes to like, writing like light novels or doujins with uh, a lot to it. A lot of it eventually comes from like, we need somewhere to start and learn and pick all of this up in a way that like, can be applied in the real world and in a way this kind of serves as that to some extent like when you look at many of the uh, like a large part of both like the game as well as the dojin uh, not dojin, the anime industry does initially in Japan at least recruit from this scene as well in a way like many of them I think like Shaft was it that no sorry Clamp initially started as a dojin circle for example oh yeah yeah. Uh, Ghost in the Shell, the author, Shiro was uh, someone who also started making doujins and stuff like that. So many of these uh, popular figures initially used this as a platform to build an audience as well as to improve. And then it serves as a good way for the uh, industry to also then try and pick out people who they might want to hire who are already very talented and who have made themselves like very successful in their own ways. I think one of the biggest ones till now, like people might actually know of, will probably be Akamatsu Ken, the creator of uh, Nagima and Love Hina. He's a politician now. Mm. Like, that's how oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. much like, the industry has been able to uh, give people the ability to, in a sense, grow and do more than they initially would have. And like, when it comes to games and anime, both, like, especially for artists, this is where many of them get recruited. And you do see like many IPs that initially start out in the Dojin industry or scene. In a way, the artists eventually find mainstream popularity, like Nagatoro as well. The uh, mm-hmm. dude that made the series used to do some really like wow shit back in the day with his Dojins. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and now his, his like 
uh, fairly successful. Yeah, yeah. Prisma Elia as well. Prisma Elia is a weird one though, since like the the Dojin was a lot more tame than the actual anime ended up being, which was like kind of hilarious to me. Yeah, oh, I remember okay. hearing hearing about that, like the anime like amped up certain things. Yeah, like like you don't get like many of the things like the French kiss sin was just a peck on the che- on the lips and that was it in the dojin and it's like it just turned into like full blown like I don't know what the fuck was going on. <laughs> <laughs> There's a mana transfer. It's, it's what happens. <laughs> yeah, they, they they certainly amped up how much uh transferring was going on there. It's always it's always been interesting to me with the the Fate series how it makes sense how much they incorporate all the like we like the whole like oh I had to fuck King Arthur to save her life <laughs> like like oh yeah I, I guess mana can be transferred through semen Shh, that that makes sense yeah that's that checks out <laughs> I mean it's, you're you're the one making the rules so well no that's like a thing like that's what spirit cookie is like that's that's like a established. So it's not like he's make, but he is making the rules, but it's not like it's something that he just completely made up. It's just it's interesting how he took these elements and like incorporated it into this arrow game about fucking like a battle royale where you fuck King Arthur or your schoolmates or whatever. It's a good thing he got King Arthur as a female as her uh, servant. That's all I'm gonna say. Imagine if like the story would have turned out very different if he had gotten Hercules or something. <laughs> would have been would have been very. How's the mana transfer going to work between Ilya and Berserker? Oh God, that, that's not how that works. <laughs> she has to what? Is it I not? I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm not the expert here. Go on, Mumi. Explain. Well, if she's having to transfer mana in the Berserker, Berserker inseminating her would not transfer mana into him. It, it's so that's she not has how that works. to inseminate Berserker. Yeah. Yeah, she has to. <laughs> I'm yeah, not going down you, that road. <laughs> What? Huh? Huh? <laughs> it's- I actually do wonder if like someone actually on like some wiki-, wiki page somewhere actually has a big like deep analysis into how that would actually happen. I feel like that's something that someone, <laughs> someone probably wrote an entire doujin about. That is, that is like the <laughs> adult doujin, but like I, I get a feeling someone would have written like a 40 page like analytical essay about it where it's just like 40 page of words explaining how that's going to happen. <laughs> that is probably like the most interesting aspect of fate to be is like the kind of like otaku aspect of like interpretation of characters where he did leave it open where like the king arthur explanation for anybody that hasn't uh experienced it uh the explanation is like oh in in real life king arthur was actually female and was posing as a man her entire life kind of thing um, but then they do have like a male King Arthur because since the legend of King Arthur, she is known as a man. There is like this alternate perception or like an alternate summon you can have where she is the male King Arthur because that's how she is perceived in like the lore of her se- like her myth or whatever. So like the the characters actually like change and stuff based off like perception of like their stories which seems very like otaku, like doujin kind of similar. <laughs> where it's just like, oh, I'm going to turn this character into a female because why not? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, there was an entire um, series of, for that, for like the Sengoku era, I think as well, right? Like that was it Oda Nobuna no Yabo or something? Oh, uh, Oda, Oda, Oda Nobunaga, yeah. The, um, the harem one where <laughs> they're all, all the generals are gr- like girls that he's adding to their harem or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, that was a thing as well. I don't know, like, I find it interesting that, like, when you go back into the older works, like, if you talk about, like, runs as well, like, a lot, a lot of that was just, uh, the, the characters that were, or I guess the, the historical figures that were known to be, like, male, they, they, they tended to leave them as is, and they found ways mm-hmm. to, like, incorporate some of the uh, questionable ones. Like, I think, like, for, uh, when you talk about King Arthur, the closest you would get for uh, Japan is, like, Uesugi Kenshin, who there are still theories that exist of people who believe that they may have been female because they used to have weird things like uh, disappearing for one month of the year or for, of the month, sorry, one day of the month or like weird pains and stuff like this. Mm. And, and there was a lot of talk about like, could they be a female? Maybe there's not, we can't find their body. So it might be. And like games also take this idea and like turn that into something as well. Well, I know y'all had like, someone made 
I forget. It's just like an art book where they're they made like dictators, and then there was another one. Oh, it was a uh, philosophers, and they just drew them as anime girls. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that actually sounds pretty interesting. I, I think the closest I can think of will probably be like a uh, AU Senki. Uh, that's a series that AU Senki rings any bells. It's a very old uh visual novel game where basically they had like characters from all over the world and all of them were female instead. Like, everyone's just a female general oh. fighter person. Yeah, I just looked it up. I've not actually heard of this one. Yeah, the, the, the game, the, the systems in the game itself are pretty interesting. But like, like that aside, the whole plot was about like female, or, or every single character or historical figure and it just being a female instead. Everyone from like, uh, the, the guy who shot the cannons in Japan and ended the Sakoku to, uh, some Aztec heroes as well. Like there's a big range of that. Hmm. And it's kind of interesting how they try to incorporate the fact that they are female into the and also the fact or uh, like parts of the original historical figure's personality into the character while also incorporating it into the design as well in a way. Um so I guess you, you kind of touched on like Pixiv being more of a thing and there's definitely in the West there's definitely been uh talk of like how they've started like recruiting animators and like key animators and stuff from Twitter and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but how, I guess like has the kind of shift to internet, like Pixiv and stuff like that, has that kind of impacted uh, Comic Hat much at all? Or is this still kind of just like, that's where you premiered a thing and then you post it online or whatever? Oh, you mean for the corporate side of stuff? Um... Yeah, I guess like in that... Um... Yeah, Dojin Circles as well. Right, yeah. Oh, okay. Because like, there is like a bunch of corporate booths that do turn up at Comic Cat as well. So I was just double checking that. So like Pixiv, I think in the last summer Comic Cat last year, they actually like went there and set up like a, a resting spot where you can just like, where they just like play like videos of their software and just be like, look, you can upload to our site and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. in terms of like premiering stuff, typically the Dojin Circles just go there and outright sell their stuff. Unless they didn't make it in time, in which case they'll just like sell a sample. Like this is what I wanted to. This this is my dying wish that never got fulfilled because uh, I, I fucked up or something like that. Mm. Uh, in in the past, I guess it used to be more the case that because of the fact that like adult content was something that could easily be brought into this event, you had like your virtual novel companies, like your key, uh, uh Basin, which is and uh. Alasoft and the rest, they'll just like go to Comic Cat and set up their corporate booth there and they would actually like announce their upcoming releases as well. But that would be like going back like 20, 30 years back when these companies were actually like fairly successful still. And during the, okay, maybe not 30, but like 20 years back, like w- back when like virtual novels were still m- massive, even within Japan, like this event was used by many of the uh, big virtual novel companies as the one place they could hold their own mini version of like E3 in a sense. So that's where you so get I, most of that. But now nowadays it doesn't really happen anymore. Like that, the, the shift, I feel like the general shift away from visual novels has left many of those companies in a position where they're not able to do it anymore. And the companies mm-hmm. that have taken their place, which are the mobile game companies, are just there more to like flex and show that they are successful rather than to a premiere that like, hey, we have this cool new thing coming up that you should be excited for. So I guess on the subject of like internet stuff, do you are you familiar or have is there like discussions as far as how these Dogen circles kind of feel about like the the kind of database sites online that kind of will scan their Dogens and like share them for free online? Is it what what's like kind of what's the feel I guess as far as like those sorts of like websites? Oh, oh I know like like set panda on the line right. I feel like it's fairly mixed. Like some are fine with it because if left to their own devices, they know that they will never get it like released overseas. So mm-hmm. for some of them, it's like, okay, cool, more people are enjoying my thing, I'm happy. But obviously there are some who are like, oh, my, my thing is getting stolen and re-uploaded and they're just very unhappy with it as well. So I would say that like, from what I've seen, it's a very 50-50 where some people have also been very against all of that. But there are many of them who are also just completely fine with it. I guess for what it's worth, there have been those, which granted, 
once you see them online, they're not usually, unless it's like immediately after, but a lot of the ones that are like kind of more popular, like been around, they're not really being sold by the circles anymore. They're kind of out of print and all that. Um, but there have been, there have been Dojins I have bought purely because I already read them. And I was like, oh, I recognize this. This would be, inter-. granted, there were also like 100 yen. So Yeah. And this is the thing with it. Like, I feel like it's, to begin with, like the reason why the sites are as prevalent as they are, it's just it's a, it's an accessibility issue as well. Like to begin with, like mm. especially if you go back, like maybe 10, 15 years, you couldn't. or well, there were regulations in place within Japan to like prevent people from bringing adult content in Japan out of the country. And when it came to like dojin stuff in general, it was just like there was a blanket, a bit more of a strictness when it came to all of that. So that might have been why it would like it would have been tough. So like the fact that the sites exist to like help to spread the fact that this content exists is actually like it's a it's a good thing and like there are many who are happy with it as well but at the same time it, it feels like this is a part of the uh, scene where you have people who don't really understand too well this thing and to them it looks more like a negative as well like i know mm. like especially when it comes to like, the music circles some of them are still completely cd based like their music is just not online at all and it's just like they just prefer to keep it that way because they want to like ensure that people can buy it or like for some of them that I've spoken to they've also said that like they feel like if they started to go online and release it there it's a whole different ball game and they don't know if they can invest in it and stuff like that so it's like I, I feel like there's also a part of it where people some people have not like fully grasped like what these things or like the sites where their work is being scanned onto are and how those things functionally work in a way that it's not like the people who run it are profiting for, off of it that much to begin with. And it's a way mm-hmm. for people to basically get these works that would not have been able to reach a global audience because of the language barrier into something that's more accessible as well. Have you found that there's, is there like a significant, I, I, I say significant as in like not just one person, right? <laughs> not necessarily that there's like a large amount of people, but um is there like a, a kind of a group or movement or anything that's kind of very like anti uh, foreigner in, in these kind of spaces? Because I know um, just for like some context, I know there is a person on Twitter. I think we I think we talked about him on stream at one point that they recently oh, that posted. Guy, yeah. yeah, they recently posted uh, uh, clips from the same Manshari Koko, which has kind of been dubbed lost media. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily lost, but it's definitely not accessible. Not easily accessible. By, yeah. <laughs> for anyone, um, really. But they're, they, this Twitter, I, I don't know if, Sai, if you can pull them up, because uh, I don't remember. But yeah, let me see Twitter if I can is, find them. I know they, uh, they have like a very large, like VHS collection of like really, like first airings from like the 70s and 80s or, not this user, yeah. the, the 80s and 90s, I guess. Um, and they're very much against like posting these things on like they do post, like they posted the clips from Monsha Coco, because I'm sure they uh wanted to kind of are they they probably like uploaded their to back up their collection online or not online, but on uh, a hard digitally. drive somewhere. Yeah, digitally. Um, but they are against like they seem to be generally against foreigners getting a hold of uh, stuff like this, which in his case specifically, I know Monster Coco is just like a hard show to get a hold of. So it's more everybody. Like he just wants his collection to be more valuable because Monster Coco is in it. This is an example. And that's not something a lot of people have access to. Um, but do you find like with the kind of perception of like sites like uh, with these dojins that are kind of like art? There's like a utility where it's being archived and like backed up, which for like a fan work, you wouldn't generally have, I guess, like you would for a production, like a official licensed production. Um, But is there like this perception of like, I don't want this isn't necessarily for them. I don't want them to have access to these things or anything like that. Uh, Truth be told, I don't think I've ever seen any that are that aggressively uh, like that. Although it could just be because there isn't really a reason for them to openly be like that in front of me as well so they, mm-hmm. they, they've, I, I don't think i've ever seen a circle display that although it does feel that like recently on twitter there has been like an increasing like movement of 
creators who just do not want people overseas uh, getting access to it in part because of all the people who like brigade them on, on there as well. Like, it, it feels yeah, like it has yeah. spawned more recently again because of like the brigading of like the random pe- tw- Twitter people who go like, ah, you draw a lolly. Ah, quick, cancel him. Yeah, right? yeah. And stuff like that. And that causes them to like close off as well. That, yeah. yeah. I mean, which is like fair because I mean, people who like that are menaces. Yeah. Like there's that yeah. and the uh, recent AI thing as well. Like it, it kind of, oh yeah. It, it kind of hit them pretty hard because for some of them, it's like, the people in Japan, they, you don't really see them going online and bragging about like how, haha, I took this guy's entire like, uh, his entire history of his artwork and I used an AI to produce more of it and stuff like that. Like you, you don't yeah. really see people doing that like here. And like for some of them, like seeing people use their art in such a way actually completely sickened them to the point that, that, that like some of them literally fell sick from it and they just like gave up completely. So it does feel like that that level of like uh, proliferation of that overseas kind of like turns people some away from it to some extent. But I feel like a large part of it is just the fact that for many of them, they don't really have the ability to speak or like read through most of what exists on the English side of like the internet much. So when these people come and do the things that they do, for them, it's like this is probably like a large percentage of what they see of the rest of the world. And in, in a way that kind of just turns them off from it to some extent as well. Mm. It's the general impression I'm getting. Now, at least from nowadays, from the people who tend to be more entire, the foreign audience, it typically is this kind of interactions that push them into that sphere. But in terms of like back in the day, I would say it's a small minority. Like it's it's typically your two chan races who tend to be like that more so than uh, the uh, general like Dojin community. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah that's that's why I wanted to make like this, make the distinction. Like when I say significant, it's it's like there's just more than one per like it's not just an individual because <laughs> uh, it's definitely not like a widespread thing. Yeah, it, it really is just more the people who got two chan brained too much in the past as well. Like there there are that. There is a significant portion of the people there, especially those from the past who are fairly, fairly anti-foreigner as well. So I, I feel like s- some of them are into content creation as well. And like, I feel like some of that may have just like spread over along with them. Uh, speaking of 2chan brain, uh, kind of off topic, but I saw y'all um, were talking about that post where it was, I don't know if it was on 2chan. It looked like it was 2chan, but it might have been on a, another site um but they're talking about like western cartoons oh yeah 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 that, that should have been talk- <laughs> yeah they're just they're just talking about it like the the anime equivalent would be like oh you think you're an anime fan you've only seen my hero academia or whatever <laughs> like, yeah. but they're talking about like oh you've only was it powerpuff girls or something yeah all you watch is like, powerpuff girls in south park you're just a normie <laughs> scrub and stuff like that oh is that like a is that that's kind of like a outlier even in like y'all's like the Jap- japanese sphere right like that was that like a kind of common or even more increasingly kind of common like this mode of discussion or the, the that style of discussion i feel like it's more it, it just is a very message board to chan era thing like if you go on to online right. message boards in japan you'll probably see a lot of people who talk like that because uh, it, it was just people from that era who tend to be like more blunt, I guess, in general with it. And th- you, you do see that level of like elitism and like people with different levels of like elitism and just like arguing among themselves more. Like, you don't really see it on like stuff like Twitter as much, I feel. But like, yeah, on, on those message boards, you do see it quite a fair bit of people who are like, I am the one guy who understands this foreign culture, the English stuff. I am the fancy am man. The yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's like, just a, a, the nature of the like anonymous way that you post on those sites. Cause like, I, I don't know how common it was to have like a trip code or anything like that on like two channel or two chan. Um, but like, you know, on Twitter it's, it, you can still be anonymous on Twitter, but it's not the same level of anonymity, right? Like it's, you can go look at their you post, post history. Right? attached. Whereas yeah. like two chan and, and like four chan, like there is, unless you were like assigning a trip code to your posts, like there's no history of whatever you said. So like is just being taken at face value on that one individual post. So I feel like that just almost breeds like a different 
mode of like interaction. Yeah, especially in Japan, I feel like because of the fact that like societally, there's a lot more pressure to act in a certain way and be nice when you're actually like face to face with people. The the mm-hmm. the the flip side of like when people are given the anonymity, they tend to like go a little harder than like you you would usually expect. I guess 4chan is quite like that as well, but. Yeah with, yeah, with Japan, you tend to see even more of a whiplash because people are like a lot more polite in general. But the moment you give them that like two chan level of anonymity, it's like they're, they're just going fully in and telling you to kill yourself as well. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would be curious, like what the history behind like why they started like interacting that way would be. I guess because like I know on four chan, the kind of mentality was like when it kind of gained more in popularity. The posts, like you, it would be harder to talk about like certain kinds of topics because now, for like on the anime board, for example, now you have say 1300 new people that want to talk about Naruto, and then the 300 people that were there before want to talk about what they're talking about. And so, like, you kind of have to, they felt the need to kind of gatekeep and like not allow certain things to be talked about or like kind of encourage certain, certain users to like lurk. The thing was like lurk more, right? Like you have to, you should right. study the board culture before you start interacting, um, and that was kind of the the excuse for like why you would engage in like elitism and like they call it self moderation. So I wonder what like that kind of history might be for like Two Chan. I don't feel like with Two Chan it did like spawn in part because of that. But but the thing is like Two Chan, I think it was. Uh, 4chan was initially built off of 2chan and so like the in terms mm-hmm. of the chronology yeah. of when they release it's about the same period and I feel like a large part of that is very similar but I feel like especially in Japan it's a way for them to vent as well even more so because of the fact that like mm. you you are kind of like the, the, the society here especially like if, you, if you're coming here as a tourist it's not so bad because they, they just see everyone who comes from overseas as like a the dumb foreigner who like probably doesn't understand our culture fully, so we'll just forgive them. But when it comes to, like, locals, speaking to locals, it's like, there's this even more, like, restrictive, like, aggression to ensure and police that everyone is behaving in a certain appropriate way. And back then, especially, when, like, the bots first came up, like, by virtue of the anonymity and the fact that, like, for the people who are really into stuff like anime and games, like, it was still something that was heavily de- demonized at the time. It, it was, like, a way mm-hmm. for them to just vent and go all out without having to worry about like holding back and all of that. So like people just ended up being fairly aggressive as well. And part of the fact that like this is the one place where they can be as open as they can be about like as, as rude and as acerbic as they want. Unfiltered. Yeah. Cause like, like yeah. people usually talk about like how polite like Japanese people are. But like if you've taken the trains at like peak hour, you, you would know that like people in their 60s, 70s, they're all fucking assholes. I mean, they're, they're nice people, <laughs> but like the majority of them are assholes. They would shove you without batting an eye, just so that they can get in <laughs> and like squeeze into the tiny corner on the like the train where, where it, like there's no reason for them to do it. And like it's like the, the people are polite because like societally there's that expectation, especially among the youths. And I feel like yeah. that, especially and the whole like thing that happened with the lost generation, this like created this very big like uh proportion of disenfranchised youth, disfranchised youths from the uh society at large and this was like the place where they could gather and feel like something and also vent all of their frustration at the wall and in a way yeah. that kind of spawned the bot culture to some extent as well uh it is interesting because like when we were when i went to japan like as a foreigner there are they there you do take advantage of things when you're there because <laughs> like as a tourist like there's obviously stuff they don't want you to do as a tourist and you kind of are like well they all think I'm stupid anyway, so <laughs> I'm just a dumb American. I can't read the picture that has a camera with a, a red line through it. I'll just take a picture anyway. Yeah, it, it, it works pretty well in, in many regards, like just having that ability to play the foreigner card. Like, like because I, for me, I studied, I initially like uh, was raised, I, I grew up and studied in Singapore. Like I, that's something I like to emphasize to them so that I can like basically be as blunt as possible at work as well at times. Like I'll mm. just I, I'll, like I'll just try to play it up so that I can be like rather than like sugarcoating and like trying to find like five thousand different ways to tell them that like this thing is wrong. I can just like tell them outright like no, I think this thing actually probably shouldn't work. We shouldn't do it. It, it, it sounds kind of dangerous rather than being like you know yeah I kind of get that you want to do this but 
uh, you know, you being the brilliant person that you are, let me let me try to understand it better and see if my understanding is wrong. You you kind of want to do it like this other way instead, right? Because then you just like, explain the entire fucking thing to them. And then like, that's yeah. probably your thought, right? Because you are so like brilliant. And then you just hope and pray to like the high fucking heavens that they'll be like, yeah, sure, let's do that instead. And like that whole bullshit like kind of slows things down quite a lot. So like personally for me, I just like to like, just take advantage of it as far as possible to like also like push stuff because it, it just makes life more convenient for everyone when like you don't have to like be stuck in that system in that sense. It, it, it the treatment like the perception of foreigners makes a lot of things convenient really because <laughs> like <laughs> when we were in uh when we'd be in tokyo like not in we never took the train during like peak rush hours or anything um but you would be on like even if it was like somewhat busy like you would generally have quite a bit of room because no one wanted to be near you because you're a foreigner <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah especially among the older crowd i i, I, fi- I find that to be quite a funny thing I guess that exists where like because they can't speak English they're just so terrified of like anyone who can't speak Japanese so like when they see someone who's obviously not Japanese they're just like fuck I better stay away so they don't they don't try to talk to me so I don't like embarrass or like weird out in front of them like there's this like fear of like because this person doesn't understand the societal norms of the country as someone who has to obey it I don't know how to interact with them mm. in that sense it's, it's it was interesting because the sh- there's a show airing this season, um, like Ayla hides her um, her feelings in Russian. Oh, the Russian show. Yeah, um, that got me. It, it got me to remember this instance that we were standing in line, and I don't remember what it was for. It wouldn't. It was like it was like a normal thing to be talking at, right? Like it wasn't like we were in some like place where you're supposed to be quiet or whatever. And we're just sitting there talking. I think it might have been uh, Sky Tree or like Tokyo Tower or something even. So we're sitting there like in line talking in English to each other because we're both na- native English speakers. I don't speak Japanese, so I couldn't even speak Japanese if I wanted to or whatever. And apparently there was a there was a girl behind us that was just like talking under her breath, like repeating herself, just like speak Japanese, speak Japanese, shut up, shut up, speak Japanese or something. <laughs> and, we're, and I didn't know it. Cause like I don't I don't understand like I can understand right. a little bit but unless I'm sitting there like paying attention like I, I didn't pay attention a lot in Japan to like what other people were doing, um, so like we got away from her or whatever and like the person I was with was like oh yeah she was just like sitting there the whole time like pissed off at us because we were talking in English. Ah, uh, wait, was it in the train or like at the site? It was it was uh, it was we were in a line like a queue. Um, waiting to go somewhere, and like I said, it was some. It wasn't something that you're supposed to be quiet. Because I would understand then if we're just like somewhere that's like really quiet and you're not supposed to be talking. And she was upset, but it's like she's just upset because we're not speaking Japanese. But she gonna say what we're saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there are there are still like unfortunately like that bunch of people like that. Which is, she like, was I mean, she was a younger she was younger too. Like she wouldn't like like I would I, I would expect that more from like the older generation than like someone who is, I think she was younger than us even. Yeah, but there, there is that segment of like fairly like, uh, I, I don't know if racist is the best word, but there is that segment of like fairly racist uh, youths in Japan. So they're not a very big segment, but they're they kind of like, like, how, how, how do I put this? Like, let me think. So like, there, there is still like some level of organized racism by like smaller organizations within the country. So like, what happened once was that in like Kumamoto, which is a different prefecture, mm-hmm. there was actually a uh, policy that they tried to get a referendum for to see if like maybe they should allow people with uh, foreign descent, I guess, like people who are naturalized like citizens or like who became a citizen to take part in politics rather than just having it be like natural born Japanese only. And like this mm-hmm. huge bunch of people came in from another prefecture, from outside of the prefecture to vote no and like push all of this out. Like, like there is mm. still this like segment of people who are like that, and I think there's actually a, like, a politician in her thirties who does push this rhetoric as well of like, no, we shouldn't like let the foreigners like get our land or like whatever the fuck she she talks about. They are very very minor in the grand scheme of things in terms of like the actual population of them, but yeah, there there, there right. are still like people like that, unfortunately. <laughs> this reminds me when we were in uh, Akiba. Um, this was when they first started doing those little silly Mario Kart things in oh. the city. Yeah, yeah. 
um, I have a picture because, like, you you know, you have the um, like the party vans that kind of go around and and you know they spout like the you know, anti like oh we need to keep foreigners out of our Japan kind of thing or whatever. Oh yeah. Um, so the, you have that van just like driving around. Um, when we were in Akiba, yeah, we're in, uh, we're in Akiba and you got like the little party van and it's like, talking about like, we need to keep foreigners out or whatever. And then like, you have the freaking, <laughs> you have the freaking Mario Kart tour, like right behind them, just following them. Ah, uh, yeah, the just position of it is just fucking hilarious. <laughs> oh, wait, is that the... <laughs> Is is this the is this one of those cults? I don't think it might. I don't think it is, but it might be. Like there there are a bunch of those like just like fucking cults that do this as well. Oh mm. yeah, <laughs> I'm just yeah. imagining that van just getting hit with like a red shell from behind. Yeah, <laughs> that's fucking hilarious. I love that. Yeah, I thought the picture went, the the they're just sitting there in traffic. And I was like, damn, that goes kind of hard. It's kind of hard. This says a lot about our society. Well, like it's not our society. <laughs> The Japanese society. Yeah, like there are still those people around. Unfortunately, I feel like yeah, no, like they are, but like they they do seem to be losing ground more and more, especially after the whole like hollow life became more and more of a thing as well. I feel like like as, as mm. people get more exposure to the fact that like the overseas content can kind of be like ours as well, and like everybody enjoys the thing we do, and like yeah. there's this increasing like push for people to learn English as well. Like in many ways, like one of my colleagues, he he just like plays League and nothing else. Like <laughs> it's always like uh, God rest, God bless his, oh, God bless, God save his soul. But like it, it is interesting to see that, like especially among the younger generation, it's also more and more people like that who kind of just value the interaction and content that the rest of the world produces. Right. Yeah. Though, although, if you're learning English through League of Legends, you may you may be in for a rude awakening. <laughs> There's certain words used in that game you wouldn't use elsewhere. <laughs> it's, it feels like it's getting more divided, I guess, between that group and the regular, like, average person because there, there's mm-hmm. also a growing number of people who kind of realize that the belief that Japan can be self-sustaining is, is not, like, truly a thing that can happen anymore. Like, I feel like a large part of, like, what makes these types of, like, anti foreigner people so aggressive in the way they are is, like, in part the belief that if even without this foreigners in our land, we'll do fine and the economy will be great. Maybe we'll recover or something. But like when you look at the grander scheme of things, it does feel like if anything, it's like the attempts to close up the country at this point would probably hurt it more simply with because of the fact that the birth rate is the way it is. And the fact yeah. that like they would kind of lose out on a lot of like the labor that drives the economy nowadays. And also the yeah. fact that like there is a lot now, especially as the uh, some parts of the industry, like both for games and anime, like as they continue to do the things they do, like especially in the rest of the region, like other countries have started to pop up and get like rapidly better and better as well. They may not have caught up yet, but they are getting there. And it's like there is a need for like the openness to ensure that the like Japan can stay competitive and all of this, I feel like. And there are more people in the industry realizing this, but at the same time, you, you do have weirdos like this, especially in the cults that are still fairly racist as well. So I guess kind of tying that back into like Comic Cat and stuff, do you feel like with the kind of increase in like audience and like the more globalization of like anime and, and manga kind of uh, as a medium, do you feel like Comic Cat and like Doja uh, events like that, do you feel like they almost have like more of an importance or do you feel like maybe like has their kind of place as like a fandom centerpiece kind of shifted or do you think there, there's still kind of like a place for them? In a global setting, it's a little half because the thing is that like with many of these artists or like the community in general, there is still that very strong perception that it's just like a lot of like Kuma adult content and like that's the stuff that gets to the forefront and because of that, it, it does feel like it's harder for some of them to gain traction overseas as well since uh, it, it does feel like aside from just like the people who are biased against it it also does feel like a large part of what content really sells when it comes to dojin content overseas tends to be the adult content more so than the uh, 
well, everything else for that matter. And some of it just has trouble keeping up as well. But that said, mm-hmm. I, I feel like when it comes to like music and uh, art itself, there are still many, like it has become an even better way for them to make a more, their name more prolific, like globally as well. And in a sense, this kind of makes it better for the artists, the musicians and all of them in a way, because now they are able to like command a higher like asking price from the companies that they are being they are requesting like or like trying to get them to help with certain like soundtrack parts or like art as well so for the most part it still helps but at the same time with the whole globalization of it all and with like especially nowadays with like korea and china coming up as well you do see that many uh dojin mm. artists are having to compete on a much like more global scale and it does mm-hmm. feel like that in a way makes it uh, both tougher for them since like you do see many games that like sometimes get artists from overseas as well to draw for the games. Yeah. And, and so like I feel like more so than the community in its entirety becoming less important it's more like Japan's space and the idea of like what is considered dojin content has been shrinking to some extent in part because of all of the competition that exists now I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Like, you know, as things kind of are more digital, I, I guess, is there like an important aspect of like keeping these kind of like physical uh, spaces alive when things are kind of starting to shift? Well, you, more? you talk to like a lot of like, um, like here in like the US, you talk to like older musicians, you know, uh, and they'll talk about like how like local rap scenes, local punk, uh, punk scenes, they don't really exist in the same way that they used to in the nineties or eighties, you know, before yeah. the internet really took off. Um, and I feel like that's like something similar you're we're seeing now with like uh, Dojin culture as well. Especially uh, after the pandemic, it does feel like that became more and more of a thing as well. Well, like even before that, it, it did feel like because of the fact that Japan used to be, or even till now is fairly slow in adopting certain technologies. The uh, Dojin scene has been able to retain its place decently well but after the pandemic mm-hmm. when there was this like sudden need for change it, it kind of caused events yeah. nowadays to like lose some level of its possession as well and, and so you do see that even with comic cat like they are restricting the uh, number of participants to some extent in part probably because they want to like manage it the number of people entering per day a little more but at the same time you do see that there is that reduction and scale that it probably wouldn't get back to the scale that was at like Comic Cat 100 a few years back. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, it's not so much that Dojin itself has become like a smaller thing. It's just more that it has shifted online and in a way become more global in that sense. Because like when you look at many, uh, like this happened in the company I'm working in now as well, where we were like trying to figure out the, uh, how to go about with the art design for the game and, uh, the internal designers were like, we could like request like certain, or just like reach out to certain for, uh, freelance artists to get their help with certain parts of the like character design and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. out of the entire list that they fed back to us as the people on the designer side, I think like eight out of the 10 artists were from like Korea and China. And that like, and most of them were also basically like freelance Dojin artists. And that was probably like part of what like hit me that like, yeah, it, the, the scene physically is getting smaller but overall it it has not really like gotten smaller if anything like thanks to the fact that like more people overseas are also picking up like on like the all of this yeah. like stuff happening on like twitter and the like you kind of do it's, seem it's, like the scene is bigger in terms of number of consumers and the number of creators is uh, hard to measure but it does feel a little bigger as well it's it's just that that growth is has been in digital spaces rather than like physically in person. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like a large part of it suddenly feels like that. Well, I think that's probably a good place to. We've been going for two and a half hours. I did want to talk about Magical Girls though. You two, you two can talk about it. I'm just gonna sit here and <laughs> nod. Because I, 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 I was watching your. Uh, 2000 sub special you were talking about how magical girls was probably like your favorite genre because i guess you were saying that you were really into kind of how it you felt it progressed yeah um what about the genre specifically kind of draws you like i outside of like the 
the progression of it, but like the genre itself, like what kind of draws you to it? Uh, for, for me, it was a lot of the, in a way, the initial like character drama that you started to see pop up a lot more, especially in the uh, middle of its evolution. So like from Madoka and before, and maybe somewhere around like, I, I hesitate to put like a start point because there's probably going to be someone who's going to tell me that actually there's this thing like from even further back that like, I may have just missed out on that also had a lot of character drama, but I feel like a lot of it, even with something like Nanoha, which in the initial season, or like which people would look as more as a bit of an action-y thing, it did feel like when you dig a little deeper into it, there was a lot more of like the uh, character interaction parts that were something that really just drew me into it. Like with, even with Nanoha, like it was a weird thing of like, when I watched it as uh, when I was a lot younger, it didn't really strike me a lot as like being like this like, super fancy thing in its own way but what struck me in the later years especially as I talked to more people about the series was like how I, I guess new ones or like how the uh, details of like how like the main character Nanoha actually ended up the way she is is something that is uh, if you look at like the overarching story of how she grew up and uh, mm-hmm. the environment she grew up in it's like you can kind of get a sense of like oh so the reason why she seems like kind of suicidal is like because of the environment she grew up in with her dad basically putting himself in like quite a similar level of risk in his own job and like the lack of like uh family I, I guess neglect is a bit of a strong word, but like the whole like lack of attention she was getting from family because everyone was a lot older and a lot busier. And a lot of that basically like when you watch it with that understanding, you kinda get a sense of why like when the whole magical girl thing happens, she's kinda like a little more uh, Gung ho and less hesitant than you would expect a normal person to be, mm, especially at her age. Yeah, yeah, like the thing that people think of as like the unbridled like optimism and courage. It's like it's coming from a less uh, innocent place than one might think. Where it's like this is the one thing where she feels like she kind of can contribute in this big way in a way, mm. and, and and there's a large part of that that like. I, I don't know, like, in the later years on rewatching it, it felt kind of interesting to me. That definitely is present in, like, Madoka, too, which, I mean, Madoka is, is uh, Shimbo, uh, so he was involved in both, but I've never really, like, thought about that aspect of Nanaha specifically, um, and that's definitely, but that, now that you mentioned it, that's definitely, like, a part of, because, like, Madoka's whole thing is, like, she's, like, selfless to, like, kind of an unhealthy degree, almost like a, like a Shiro or from Fate kind of thing. Yeah, and it's like typically with stuff like this is that you kind of see that like there is that nuance in the way that the character is brought up that isn't really like very on the surface. Like it's just in the background, but when you start to look into it, it's like, oh yeah, it kind of makes sense why they're this weird. Yeah, I'm I f- I feel very similarly where <laughs> like I, I I really enjoy mind you, I got into the Magical Girls because of like the kind of two pronged kind of um the way it's like presents the world, right? Because like it's it's such a disconnect from the sort of media I was used to. Because uh, not only is it like female centric um, and kind of looking at things from the female lens and like kind of that perspective a lot of the time, it's also from a different culture entirely, right? So it's so kind of removed from my experience. Like it is almost like inherently interesting in that way where you're like, oh, this is like a completely different way to view the world or operate in the world or whatever um and then he, yeah definitely the the kind of lineage of magical girls um kind of going from how it's kind of conceived at least from like the perot uh you know miki momo or meet and cream mommy um those kind of shows to now like the way it's kind of evolved is interesting which i hear a lot of people talk about isekai in that like that database sense but there's not a lot of I don't there's a lot of people talking about Magical Girl, but I don't feel like they talk about it in that way. Kind of like how each sort of iteration is kind of a response in some way from the to the genre in like a previous sense. Um, yeah, it does feel like I guess maybe it's just more a thing of like it isn't as there isn't as much like content in that space in a way. Like with Isekai, you kind of do have like, especially nowadays, a whole like deluge of it, and it feels like because of that. There is a lot more, especially because of the fact that there are a lot of uh, people who are into it as a result. They just see more people talking about it in general. But with Magical Girls, it feels like, especially 
in I, I don't know how true this is. Like this is just my speculation. But like in the West, mm-hmm. you do have like because the characters are all like small little goals. There are there is a bit more of a uh, preconceived like I don't know. Like some people, they're just gonna be this a uh, bigger group of people who are just like not very into it or like we're just gonna condemn it just purely because of that on its own. And in a way, right. that kind of results in it like being that you just don't have as many people talking about it because it's something that ends up being a, just a little bit more fringe in a way. Well, you even see that with people that, like, at least in the West, I've seen that with people who even enjoy Magical Girls. Like, there's this weird way that they kind of, like, engage with the genre where you'll see something like a Magical Girl Destroyers come out. And it's it's sort of like a Magical Girl show, but I would say it's more of like a like a taku kind of piece. But they, since it is has Magical Girls and then it says Magical Girl Destroyers or whatever in the title... They're engaging with it as if it should adhere to certain properties of a magical girl show. And if it doesn't kind of fit into that box in that way that they kind of preconceive it should, it is suddenly like bad or a problem or something. Mm, yeah, I mean, with that, it's like always felt like a bit of a tough one like for me to grasp as in the way that they get pissed over it. It's like, in the end, it's like the, the genre itself has like, evolved quite a fair bit over the generations and it feels like on what premise are those people even saying that it has to be like this and not that and stuff like that like what like i guess the uh what would con- be considerable a definition for like magical goals uh, in and of itself feels a little tough to pin down in that sense like there, yeah, there was it's... one series that i was reading because it's a more novel thing specifically but like there, there's one called uh let me, let me find the English name. Uh, Maji Rumie Corporate Limited. Kabushiki Kaisha. Maji Rumie, Which is like a series about like uh, a corporation of that like runs magical goals and like helps it, that like tries. I, more like how do I put it? Is that, is, that getting an, is that the one that's getting an adaptation in the fall? I think so. There's the one about like the magical goal startup company thing. Where they, like, think... they, yeah, where it's like more of a corporate thing overall as well. I think that's yeah, that's it. Yeah, I saw somebody talking about the manga recently, and that's, I was like, oh, this is getting an anime. I guess I just won't read the manga. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's that. I'm, I'm interested in seeing that. I haven't, I'm not familiar with the, I, I know the premise of it, but. Yeah, but yeah, um, there's like stuff like this. There's uh, Magical Destroyer that you mentioned as well. Like the definition of what would be considerable a uh, Magical Go anime, like I feel like depending on what those people are bringing up as like what needs to be in, it might be a little, I don't know. Like it feels like one of those things where it's hard to. I feel like there's like a reactionary sort of thing going on where. What, what, what do they consider like a core component of it? Is it the transformation scene? But, the, but at that point, it's like many shows have transformation scenes that aren't exactly a magical goal thing. Is it like you need to watch them like fucking die and suffer? But that's not really a magical girl thing either. But like, it, it feels they it's it seems like they're coming at it from again the reactionary thing where it's like they watched magical girl shows when they were younger, so like a, a Sailor Moon or Hard Captors or something or uh, Mermaid Melody or whatever, and that is kind of how they view the genre and like how they kind of engage with it. And they view something like a Madoka, while like fine as like a one-off, like a not like no one complained about Nanoha in that way. Yeah, which was uh, bizarre to me, to be honest. Like when you look at Nanoha, it's like it, it doesn't. At some point, it stops feeling like magic and just starts feeling like science. Like everything just seems to be like oh, this is. sci-fi thing midway, and yeah. that's fine with most people. Like, which is why I feel like it's it. It feels like there's just this like very perhaps this very like narrow criteria that they feel like needs to check all the boxes for to be considered a magical girl anime but like it's a it's a genre that has like such breath to it that it feels hard to like pin it to just the specific things i don't know although that, that just might be me but i think i think it's just because they basically they like the quote unquote aesthetic of like a magical girl like a for kids where you, it's like low stakes uh problem of the week or whatever um like basically you just think of Sailor Moon or Tokyo Mew Mew. Like that's the kind of thing that they want as a magical girl show. So like they have Precure, but I guess like they want more than just Precure. Um, 
which I mean, they do. They, there are shows coming out. They just don't watch it. Um, right. Um, but like, there's just like a weird. They don't really engage with the genre in a way that would like open them up to something that kind of is experimenting more with it. Um, and like they view something like Monica, like again, Monica would be fine on its own, but since it sort of inspired this trend of like what they call dark magical girl shows or edgy magical girl shows or whatever, yeah, where now you're getting um, magical sight or magical raising project or something. And they view those as just like torture porn or just edgy for the sake of being edgy like that. Now that now Monica and the shows like that are a problem because they are pushed out this perceived space for like young girls to ha- be able to watch like a, a magical girl show because now they're not able to watch that because all the magical girl shows are for adults who are wanting to watch girls get tortured or whatever. I mean, but at the same time, I just feel like one of those things where like, it's not like all of that has turned into that, but it is true that there have been people who have grown up with this genre and who are still interested in it and like, if there are people who want to tell like a unique story with it, like, like Madoka especially, it feels like one of those things where it's obviously not aimed at kids, but it tells a very interesting story, especially when the twists start to come in. Or I guess not so much a twist, but like when the plot reveals start to come in, you kind of realize that this uh, plot uses the concept of magical goal and for a much more like interesting overall like story in the end that is... Yeah, I mean, like, the, the whole idea of a magical go in it as, like, more of a driver for the plot more so than the plot itself in that sense, it feels like. Yeah, it's... There's just, like, a weird way, because, like, the, the, the discussion around Madoka is, is kind of similar to, like, Evangelion in a way, where people can fall into the trappings of being like, oh, Madoka is a deconstruction of the genre. And, like, it, it almost comes off like... um when people make the discussions anyway, when people make like a, a visual novel and they're like, Oh, this is like other visual novels. This one's making like a parody and making fun of visual novels. And it, it's, it's like, you, do you really, there's like this weird level of like discussion where people are like saying that Monica is a deconstruction. They don't really view it as like a magical girl show. They view it as some kind of like harsh, critique or like subversion or what you know a deconstruction of the genre is how they put it and people are like oh no this wasn't like the first one to like do dark stuff or do that like you have uh princess tutu or sailor moon had like death in, in the show and like dark moments and then even going back to like a uh, nurse angel ririka which is you know quite dark um and so they kind of use that. It, it, it's just like a weird way that like level that the discussion is at. And it's just, it needs to like kind of evolve. <laughs> like it, it, I don't know. It, it feels in a way like it, it's just like, perhaps might be those people overthinking it as well. Like it, it feels like with Madoka, it just was like, you want the, the, the creator wanted to. And the thing is that in the end, we're all just like assuming what we think the creator wanted to do, but it does feel like the, he just wanted to tell an interesting and dark story that happened to use the premise of magical girls in a way perhaps because like it like contrasts well with the whole like innocence that the genre is supposed to have and so on and so forth but I don't know if I would consider it like a full on this this deconstruction of the whole thing in its own way or a parody because like it feels like with many shows you could probably also make that argument like there was this like very horrible like magical girl series about like Characters from a pachinko machine called a uh, Kaito Tenshi Twin Angel. Oh, Twin Angel, yeah. You know, when, when I when I watched the first season of that, I I legitimately thought it was satire, satire the whole time because like everything was so weird, and it's like it, it feels like the kind of thing where if if you put your mind to it, many things could be seen in such a way as well. Where it's like the weird pauses, the fact that the characters don't react to people dying. Like, I think there's one episode in it where, like, the uh, villain fell off a building and they just, like, dropped to the first floor and, like, the, 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 the two main protagonists just stood there with blank faces and just walked away after, like, five seconds. And it's, it's stuff like that that you could also say, like, oh, yeah, this show, which was clearly bad, is actually meant to be a satire of the industry or something. But, I don't know, like, it feels like at points it might just be people overthinking, like, all well, of this to some extent as well. As in the people who are like saying that like Madoka isn't a magical girl or like 
it's a problem of like the uh, whole. I think, I think people. I think it could be a problem if you're overthinking it in a way that you're basically telling people how not to engage with something. Um, for something like what you're kind of giving with the um, twin angel, like I feel like I'm okay with that kind of overthinking because it's coming from like a place of trying to appreciate something in a way that other people aren't necessarily. Whereas something where it's like, if you're overthinking Madoka and you're like basically trying to dictate how people engage with it, I think that can, that's kind of a problem in itself. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a new one. There's a gradient. There's a nuance. Like, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're very right there. Yeah. And I feel like the whole thing of like the series that came after it being like, a, a, I mean, to be fair, it's like to, to expect some level of a shift as a result of Madoka would have been expected. I would have thought as well, like with how oh, yeah. it was and how successful it was, like people would probably try to emulate it. And it's like, it, it would happen. Like, I, I feel like the whole, like, oh, this is all Magical Girl is going to be feels like a quite a fair overreaction that most people had as well, in a way. Yeah, I mean, even... As cynical as like people paint a lot of those shows to be, I actually rewatched. Um, I didn't like go through the whole show and rewatch it, but I rewatched a lot of uh, Magical Girl Raising Project. Like even that, at least demonstrates like a, a working understanding of the genre, and like has some reverence for some of the stuff. Like it still is talking about like what is truly a magical girl, and it does the whole like girl gets powers, jumps, and jumps. F- like the whole precure thing where they jump and they like fly through the air or whatever, but she like hits her roof or whatever. Um, it's demonstrating like a, a level of like understanding where it's like, it's not just coming from this place of like, Oh, magical girls are just cute girls using magic. I'm going to make it dark. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. With, with that show, actually, like, it, it's t- I don't know. The, 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 if I had like one uh, show that I have pointed out with this show, it's probably just like, how little it feels like the main protagonist does in the entire thing. But aside from that, it's like they, I, I can see, like you said, that there are quite some like redeeming points to the show as well. And the, it doesn't yeah. feel like a complete cash grab. It's not like I'm not gonna say like you have to like the show all of a sudden. Like you can still dislike Magical Race. Like I don't think it's really particularly super well written. Um, but it's I think there's definitely like there was definitely like a reaction to it that kind of was like like you saw it with like Yuki Yuna too. Um, Yuki Yuna, like, everyone was like, oh, this is just... Well, first, no one knew what the fuck it was, because, like, <laughs> I think all the promotion material just made it sound like it was a slice of life anime. So it was like, oh, okay. Direct... Like, it looks like fucking President Arya is in here with that's a cow now, so we'll just watch a slice of life anime. And then, like, it airs, and it's a Magic Girl show. You're like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, you get to the end of the first season, and it's like, what the fuck is going on? And people were like, oh, this is just a fucking Madoka, like a, a Walmart Madoka, like it's a ripoff of the show. And, and it's like, no, like now we're just like being reductive. Now we're <laughs> writing stuff like Madoka, like Yuki Yuna is not really, I mean, it, it, it follows some of the similar kind of plot conventions. Like it does like the whole reveal and like using characters as like certain examples for things and stuff. Like, it, it, it kind of follows a similar pattern, but like, the, what the show is trying to accomplish as a whole is not the same as what Monica is trying to accomplish. <laughs> like just writing it off is missing out on something. Yeah, there's a lot of that as well. It feels like where, where like the nuance of what the show is trying to be kind of gets lost because like people are just focusing a little too much on the overarching theme, I guess, in a way. Like, oh, it's mm. just magical girls like getting uh, put in like horrible situations again. Therefore, it's Madoka without like looking at the fact that like the way the story is being told and what the themes that they're focusing on the story is actually kind of different in that sense. But it, it kind of just almost it's almost revealing of how people kind of these preconceptions kind of affect people's enjoyment of stuff. Because like people said that about Yuki Yuna and then Yuki Yuna actively like weaponized like people's assumptions of it where people were thinking like oh it's just gonna be like a Madoka or whatever because it's written by I think it's written by the same author who wrote Kamega Kill. Which, yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, and then it uses that because everyone's like assuming it's going to be like Madoka. And it uses that to be like, oh, actually, none of these characters are like going to be permanently disfigured or anything. Like they're just, it was just like a temporary thing. It was a temporary offering to the gods, as they put it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was like, and it, they subverted it in a way that was actually fairly interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not like it's just like an ass pull, right? Like they 
foreshadow it, I think in like episode six or five, um, the center directly talking about like how they give offerings to the gods or whatever, like why they put offerings at shrines and they're like, oh, do we just leave it there? And like, no, you get it back, but you like offer it to them and then you get it back. So the next, the next day or whatever they said. Taken on loan. Yeah, it's a lo- you're loaning it. <laughs> um, so it's like this is something that they thought out and was like constructed into the show. But like since people were just writing it off as like this edgy like Monica clone, they're like, oh, I didn't even have the balls to like actually commit and like kill the characters. They like just get all their stuff back. And it's like, no, it's now we're just being. What do you want? Yeah, it's like, do they want <laughs> it to be Madoka or do they want it to actually be its own thing? That's the thing. Like- do you want them to be permanently disfigured or not? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it does feel like because of like how much the community has, sh- or I guess how much the genre shifted at like certain points, it, it kind of led to like this fragmentation of like really just people wanting very different things and just like being very cynical about the other like different changes in the genre in a way, I suppose. Yeah. Have you Are you going to watch like... Uh... Have you watched like a Human Chan's Ribbon or um, Fancy Lala or like some older like Magical Girl shows? Or are you kind of? I, I actually did go back and watch some of them as well. Um, what what would you say are your top five Magical Girl shows? Oh. this is this is the hard hitting questions. <laughs> <laughs> This could just be the question you ask every guest. What are your top five magical girl shows? You will be judged accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't watch magical girls. Oh, no, I don't no. watch. Them. I don't think I've seen five. <laughs> oh, this. Is tough. Let me think. Let me think. Give me just a little bit of time to think. Are you good? Mm. Yeah. No. No pressure. This is just the answer that you know you will be held accountable for. <laughs> This will decide how you're being uh, you're being presented in this part. (laughs) When you're at the (laughs) gates of heaven, (laughs) we can just have a picture of like very angry man saying no, nothing from before the nineties or like some fucked up shit like that. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, I guess I guess for in in no like uh, specific order, ribbon or kishi, uh, okay, precure. Mm-hmm. Nanoha Madoka and uh, I, I hesitate to say Mahawako for the fifth so maybe I'll say Yuki Yuna instead <laughs> well Yuki that's a good choice Yuki Yuna is based so for I feel like I'm maybe I've said it before but for for transparency mine would be Madoka Princess Tutu mm-hmm. Ojimajo Dorami like as a full series uh Full Moon and then Card Cap Sakura. Followed followed closely by Hime Chan's Ribbon and Cream Mommy, but Yeah, Card Cap as well. I, I went back and I watched it and it's like it still holds up, but at the same time, I, I feel like it, it comes like a close six for me. Mm. If like if I were to put okay. it in. No, I, I just yeah. love like going back and watching it and realizing how like there was just like BL undertones the whole time, even though it's not actually a thing in the show at the start with like Shao Run. Mm, yeah, like, like that was a little funny. It's kind of interesting how they present that, though. Yeah, like, like both that and uh, was it Tomoe and Sakura as well. Like all of that was uh, quite different. Ah, oh, it's tough. Would I actually put that? Yeah, no, actually, mm, maybe cut Captain instead of Yuki Yuna. Actually, although like no, see the thing with cut Captain is like there's a little bit of this weird bias for me because like the characters kind of do remind me of the Tsubasa Reservoir Chronicles Chronicles as well. And, and oh, like, yeah. I feel like that that leads in a part to like my attachment to the characters more. So so like yeah, I'll just leave it as a close six instead, because I, I would Fair. have to like go back and like maybe drink an entire bottle of whiskey and reflect on my life a little too. <laughs> no no for sure I'll put it in the top five. Since you since you really like Nanoha, have you ever seen a uh, Sinful Gear? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I've seen it. The uh, I have I have a friend who's really really into it, but like for for me. Yeah, it feels like it's in that similar vein where like you kind of had like more like sci-fi magical girls instead where it's like Yeah. It, it kind of yeah. makes the question like are, are they even using magic at that point or is it one of those things like where, where, the, where the one smart man said that like when technology gets to a certain point it just feels like magic instead. Yeah, any sufficient 
uh, sufficiently advanced technology will appear the magic as magic or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it kind of has that vibe, and it has that that arrow feels like it, it drove like this weird, like highly combat focused magical goals as well. In a sense, mm. like 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 if you look at like the more recent Nanoha stuff as well, it's like like Vivid Strike was just like people punching each other and like breaking bones. That was just like a sports anime. Yeah, it was just like a MMA sports anime. <laughs> what what the fuck is going on? And like when I when I watched the movies as well, it's just like it, it looked like they're just like dog fighting in the air instead. Like it, it just turned into like more combat focused magical goals in that sense. And the, it, it, and like Symphol Gear kind of had that vibe as well. Where it's like yeah. sci-fi we battle and like the battle is like a larger part of it as well. But it is fun. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Like I, I enjoy like watching the battles as well for those because of like how different it is in a way. Like when you go back to Madoka, it's like you, you don't see them focusing as hard on the like people hitting each other. It's more like the visuals of the witches themselves and the world that they are in when they're in yeah. there during the battles more so. Like there's a I whimsy. There- oh sorry. Oh, you go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was, was going to say this. There's like more of a whimsy to it rather than like a, we're going to concentrate on like these Michael Bay special effects of like combat in that sense. Yeah, kind of. it's kind of closer to like what magical goals were because like Hemi Chan's Ribbon, like there's, it's just like you're given a magic power, right? Like a lot of the magical goals before that, it's not like some, you know, Super Sentai inspired or... Uh... <laughs> yeah. But I, I will say like something that like is underappreciated like people don't really talk about Amadika is like how interesting like the power system kind of is in that um because like I remember watching Dorami like they kind of they do this thing where it's like oh you have to use a a, a musical instrument that you were attached to or like something like that to like use as your uh tacto your like magical instrument or whatever um, and I thought that was really interesting because, like, you know, Aiko brings a harmonica. Um, Dormi, I think, brings a uh, piano. It's just like they have like these arcs where it's like tied into like music and stuff. But like, that's not really brought into the show in any meaningful way <laughs> outside of like a couple like episodes where they talk about it. Like the powers themselves are completely removed from any musical elements, really. <laughs> Does a character ever use a trumpet to bring down the walls of Jericho? Uh, I think that's in season six of Dormy. Okay. That's really the one where they, really they reject Dormy. the system and start fighting God. D. He <laughs> follows the same arc as the uh, Toy Story movies. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, but not like in, in Madoka, like they directly tie the powers to the events of the show where there's like this kind of added layer of like meaning to it where it becomes interesting to like just dissect what their powers kind of re- reflect or represent. Um, and that's not really present in a lot of Magical Girl shows. Yeah, it, it feels like the norm up to that point would really have just been like a, a girl happens to get a hold of some like otherworldly power and, and then they fight thing to like save the day. Like even, even with Nanoha, the way it started as well, it's like, she just chanced upon the power and it was just like, ah, yeah, we, we kind of need you to like help both of us not die now. And, and she just has a fairly like normal looking power as well. It's not like the, the powers before were like devoid of meaning. Yeah. Um, in the sense of like, uh, cream mommy, for example, like the powers are chosen to sort of give them like a different perception. And like, so a young girl watching at the time, can like see the world being kind of interfaced in a way that's different from like how they interface with the world, but from a character that's relatable to them, right? Um, Himi Chan's Ribbon is kind of probably the best example of that because she just turns into different people. And so she's able to kind of use that power to emphasize, em- empathize with different people and kind of view the world from their eyes and their perspective. And then she then is u- using that power to like problem solve in a way that is empathetic and like kind of teaching people, teaching young girls to problem solve and not necessarily rely on magic. It's, it's, it's something that's kind of like used in Dorami as a, a plot point where they're like, don't, you don't necessarily rely on magic to solve your problems because you can solve your problems on your own 
but they use magic in a way that's like entertaining to like kind of facilitate the problem solving. Um, so it's not like the, the magic was just like meaningless or something, but it, it's not as like thematically dense, I guess, as like a. Yeah, it's more like it's designed in a unique way that allows them to drive the plot in that sense. Or like to, mm-hmm. pro- to bring across a specific message as well. I guess you can kind of look into the weapons and references and stuff in Sympho Gear. Like, I, I don't know how much of a connection there is with like Gunganir. Admittedly, I didn't get into Sympho Gear enough to where I would be interested in looking into this stuff. I did enjoy it. <laughs> but like, I don't know if Gung, there's like parallels with like Gunganir and, and Hibiki or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it feels like... There probably is to like the the mythos behind the weapon, but it it was it, it did feel like it didn't have like it didn't tie the character's like uh personality and like backstory in the way the Madoka did I, into like why they have the weapon that they have in that sense. Yeah. But yeah, like for, yeah, it's, for me, it's like especially for simple game nowadays, it's like all all I remember are the live performances because I feel like that's all they are doing nowadays. I do. I would. I would like to. I, are they, are they still doing live performances? I thought they were and the, pretty like, much done. last year or the year before. Like, mm. it was a little while back. I remember one of my friends came from overseas and he was like trying to say like he, he wants to watch it because like it's probably going to be the last time, if not one of the last few times they're doing this. And sure enough, it was really like quite close to the end for that. Yeah, I, they're getting they're getting older. Uh, Simple Gear is not relevant anymore, so it probably. I can't imagine them doing any more after this unless they just make another season. Which I do think they're making something. Probably. I mean, they just released the uh, mobile game of year or two back, was it? That's a new one or something. I don't recall. Maybe that was what I was thinking. I know they announced some Simpho Gear thing, but you know how that is? Like, they'll announce, like, new Simpho Gear or new whatever, and then, like, it's either a Pachinko game or a Gacha game or gotcha something. Gacha game. <laughs> But they make it sound like it's an anime or something. Yeah. There's a new show from you having the creator of Simpho Gear or some of the team that worked on it. That'll be fun. Next season, right? I is it next season already? Fuck. Is it it's uh is it Acro Trip? Is that what it was? Let me see, hold on. You mean summer? No, fall. The fall season. Oh, no, right, next season. Princess Session Orchestra. Oh. No, that's not what I was thinking of. I can't. I'm really bad with names off the top of my head. <laughs> this thing. Yeah, I remember us looking into that. It's 2025. Yeah, I'm going to say, like, already? What the hell? Uh, just director of uh, Prilia. I mean, let's be real. Sifo Gear is a concept, is just like fucking awesome as fuck, where it's just like. <laughs> You have to sing to keep powers up on the battlefield. You're basically like these fucking battle Valkyries, like going around. I was around very surprised the show they things. never were, like went like the idle route with that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, they kind of. I mean, it's, it's, I feel like Satellite has done like a lot of idle stuff. Like they did the AKB48 anime. Yeah. Um, they did like Macross Frontier. I don't remember if they did Delta or not. Did they do the uh? Wait, who who was the one that did the Mecha Idol Master? Was that also them? There's like this weird like. I don't master mecha anime that came out at some point as well. I don't think so. Uh, didn't you watch that recently? Hi. Uh watch what? The Idol Master Mecha. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that was that satellite? No, that was uh that was Sunrise. Oh, well, Sunrise, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is <laughs> what made it so funny. They did this. They did the Idol Master Mecha and then Love Live. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it looks, I mean, like, looking at just, like, what we have so far going off of it, it really does feel like, at least the people who complain a lot about Madoka and Dark Animes probably, hopefully don't have much to complain about this time. Although they'll probably find something else to complain about as well. <laughs> I feel like. I mean, Always find something to complain about. This actually kind of reminds me of uh, Prism, Magical Sweet Prism Nana. Which I remember getting announced, and then everyone's like, "Oh, what is this going to be?" Because it was, I think, it was Shaft, like another Magical Girl Shaft original. And it was like, you see, like the the promotion image or whatever, and everyone was like hyped for it, and then like it just disappeared for a long time, and everyone's like, "What the fuck is this supposed to be?" And then like finally, like two, like OVAs aired, like 
I think it was like five years later or some some ridiculous. <laughs> was like, oh. I didn't really follow like what happened to it at the time because I remember it was supposed to have like seven episodes or something. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, this 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 was initially like announced at one of the comic cats as well, I think, funnily enough. Yeah, it was seven episodes. The first third thirty second pilot previews of all seven episodes that were uploaded on YouTube. But only two were screened. But that's what that's what this what this princess session orchestra reminded me of is like looking at the posters like oh this is look at that oh yeah like even though there's a text font the text font reminds me of what was that series it reminds me of something else as well simultaneously like I don't I don't think it was pre cure was it? it was one of the seasons that kind of had something like that I think it was like smile pre cure kind of had like it, it, the the font reminds me a little bit of that as well. The princess session font? Yeah, that they the text on the bottom which they're standing on for princess session. Uh, for some reason, it, it, almost, I just get like a little bit of small pre kill vibes from that. It almost reminds me of Urahara's font. Am I thinking that right? It's not colorful like that, but it kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does seem like that as well. But I guess we'd be going. <laughs> Sai is going to like have a fucking stroke. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about how I'm going to edit this right now. Like, where, are, what the fuck am I going to do here? <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll, we won't we won't keep you much any longer. Yeah, it's been like three hours. We've, been, we've now been going for over three hours, which means I get it's, to cut all that. <laughs> it's fine. <it's high>. No. <laughs> three hours. Holy shit! I didn't know this either. All right. Um, but yeah, thank thanks for coming on. Uh, everybody, check out overworked salary man's channel i i really enjoy i'm glad you kind of talked about it but i'm glad that you're in japan and you're like making content that's accessible as far as like the doujin sort of uh, events and like smaller stuff because that's some of that's always kind of what i've always wanted is like yeah, somebody that's yeah. like actually there and is able to like talk about these things but there's never really at least on youtube there hasn't really been access to that if you don't speak Japanese. Yeah, and I feel like um, because of the type of content there is, there's like there's also some level of apprehension about like talking about it perhaps as a YouTuber since so like Yeah. 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 But for me it's like in part because of the fact that I did work in a adult version novel company in the past, I'm, I'm just less bothered by it I guess maybe. I don't know. So it's like, yeah. You know, there is more to the industry than this. I mean the more to the, the uh, dojin scene than just that. And it's like, yeah, it'd be cool if you yeah. saw more of it. It's how it feels like. No, I'm glad yeah, you guys some... enjoy it, if anything. Oh, yeah. I, I really enjoy, like, some of my favorite content is, like, um, when you went to, like, uh, the quarterly weeb report thing you did, where you went to the DD Girl event, and, like, just being able to see, like, because we can't go to those unless we spend, and, like, we the access we would have to these things yeah. is very limited. We need to like figure out how to like astral project, you know, all the way into Japan. I mean, that's that's a thing humans can do, definitely. We yes. we just need to untap, use a hundred percent of our brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's 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 great like having a resource that kind of like catalogs these things that's kind of more accessible, I guess, as an English speaker. Um, so we've we've been really enjoying your content. I mean that's really good to hear. Since that, at least that means that like me me doing this for the Dojin stuff did actually pay off to some extent. So that's good to hear for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but thanks, thanks for coming, coming on. on. Oh, thanks for having me yeah. on. If anything, we're 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 mooching off of you. <laughs> You're giving us <laughs> free content. I mean, like I don't know, like the, the the conversation was pretty fun. So hey, yeah, yeah, it was great. We oh, try, I enjoyed it as well. We try to be fun. It's over. Uh.